listening to episode 105 of Mighty Life Radio. I am Matt Blackburn. Today, I have back Adam Bergstrom, also known as the OG Sugar Daddy. <laughs> Some of my friends call him that. Because legend has it, he actually consumes 25 pounds a month of refined, processed sugar. Dun, dun, dun. But he's still alive. And his brain works great. Sharp as a tack. Very intelligent man with a sense of humor. And all of that sugar is obviously not destroying his brain. And certain people might say, well, give it time. You know, it'll catch up with him. But I feel like that's actually true with the Omega-3s, the polyunsaturated fats, those are the true, as Adam calls it, death by a thousand cuts or a slow kill with the PUFAs. But with sugar, there is immediate benefit and long-term benefit. And it's always in balance. Obviously, it's not about eating only processed sugar or sugar water, (laughs) like the character in Men in Black. But it's about having sugar with animal protein. And by sugar, that could also mean potatoes, squashes, fruit, maple syrup, honey. You don't have to do processed cane sugar extract. It's not necessary. But I've found personally, Adam's found, that it's been very beneficial for our health. So Adam Bergstrom is a regular guest here on the show. He is like a walking encyclopedia, and he has spent hours and hours in libraries. And it also feels like I'm talking to an old friend that I could just talk to for hours and hours. So we talk about liver health. We talk about carbohydrates, um, terrain theory, vitamin D, muscle building, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, aging, omega-3s, and of course, sugar. So here we go. Here is Adam Bergstrom. All right, Mr. Adam Bergstrom, welcome back to the show. Glad to be here. (laughs) Yeah, everyone loves uh, all of our previous shows. I think this is number seven. Uh, you're my my record return guest just because <laughs> people love it. It's just, uh, it's kind of all over the place, but there's so much info that people can apply. And um, people like all your, your stories. And uh, I like on Facebook, I think I saw yesterday, you always reference the guy that ate a whole Cessna plane. <laughs> yeah, he actually ate 18 shopping carts. So many, uh, he ate a coffee. He ate bicycles, the entire bicycle. I think there were some parts of the Cessna he didn't eat. But this guy was digesting a lot of it, too. He's called Mr. Eats All, and you can look him up on YouTube, and he's got a Wikipedia page. Now, he died at 57, uh, of a, but it was of a knife wound. My question is, was it internal or external? <laughs> Yeah, I wonder, wouldn't that be a lot of heavy metals in all those those materials? I know. It, it's really interesting that he uh, made it to 57 because I think it started when he had the ability to do it uh, as a teenager and he decided he could make a living on it. And so he got the, he ate razor blades every day, razor blades. And, and he got indigestion by eating bananas. Just amazing. Yeah, check out wow. the videos on him on YouTube. They're, they're really interesting. <laughs> yeah, I guess that means there's more to health. I mean, that's kind of proof, right? That there's more to health than just physical, because if, you know, that would tear up the intestinal tract, right? <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, it, that's what they thought. So they did x-rays and it wasn't really torn up. Occasionally he had a wound, though, every once in a while. Something didn't work right or he didn't digest it or whatever. But by the way, my son actually had a friend that ate liquor bottles. And what he would do, he would go to a bar and he would intimidate people. Someone would give him the stink eye 
He would just look at them, uh, order a half pint of booze in the bottle, drink the bottle down, and then eat the bottle while looking at the guy who was giving him the stink eye. And uh, it discouraged fights. <laughs> so, wow. The guy went crazy. The last time I saw him, uh, saw him, he and his mother tried to get him off the freeway when he was lying across the freeway. He ended up in the loony bin. So I, I, I think my son lost track of him now. But uh, he had several of these friends. Another guy who could uh, stab himself with needles and feel no pain and wow. use hypnosis, sleep with his eyes open. Yeah, he hung out with uh, my son's kind of unusual himself. Uh, his nickname is Caveman. Because he's so strong, when he worked in uh, for a Walmart, he could open the doors with one hand that the truck drivers couldn't open with two, and so they named him Caveman. Wow, yeah, strength has always been fascinating to me. And uh, a few of the Q and A questions, people were wondering about your thoughts on muscle building. And I remember like going from vegetarian, which I just felt weak on, no matter how many eggs I ate, like a dozen or two dozen, I still wouldn't feel strong. But something about red meat, maybe it's my blood type, I don't know. I was able to do standing ab rolls from standing nose to ground and back up multiple times. And my bodybuilder friends were just looking at me like I was crazy because they could never do that. <laughs> and it was just, it, it was like after eating, you know, a pound of red meat for the first time in years. <laughs> you know, th there are strange things with strength that have multiple issues, both mental and both physical. But meat does seem to do that. Now, some people do well. One of the greatest strongmen was a guy called the great Apollo, I believe, the Scottish Apollo, William Bankier. And he was a vegetarian. He could lift an elephant. They put a big stand up. He stood on top of it. And with an elephant with a rider, he would go and squat with him. I mean, and rise from a squatting position to a standing position with an elephant. How many tons that is? I don't think anyone's ever duplicated. Yet other people, other bodybuilders say meat makes a difference. I notice meat gives me extra strength because when I played around with complete vegetarianism, uh, I found a definite weakening. And uh, whether that's me or not, there's a lot of mysteries with strength. Yeah, it's interesting to watch the, the carnivore diet take off, right? Because it's kind of like that extreme and... For me, like when you restrict carbs, you're um, affecting thyroid hormone, which affects every cell in our body. <laughs> Definitely. And that's why, you know, fasting, I never did really well on. And, uh, and now I'm seeing why. And my mentor, Adonal Lay, after a while, when he saw bad effects from a lot of fasting, he uh, didn't recommend it anymore, except maybe Saturday, but always a juice fast. So you had the sugar for protein sparing ability. You know. Yeah, I think a lot of people don't realize that, that uh, eating carbohydrates decreases your need for protein, right? It does. And that's one thing, protein sparing. Same way with William Budd treating diabetes type 1 with sugar. He realized that the, tr the trouble why the sugar was in the urine, it was eating the muscles away. My own dad died of diabetes way too young and went blind and had his kidneys fail before that happened because they put him basically on a keto diet. And so what's going to happen? The muscles got eaten. Wow. Yeah, I was just watching because I like to watch what's going on in the health community with these people with health centers. And it was these uh, these guys that owned a health center and they were on the beach and they just finished a seven day dry fast. And then they uh, introduced a little dry fasting retreat. And they said, since we did it, we know the pitfalls and downfalls. <laughs> and so <laughs> come here. And you could pay us and we'll help you dry fast for a week. I'm like, wow, that's quite a business, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, a lot of people are doing dry fasting now. And that's one, uh, I definitely use some water for that. I don't drink water by itself. It's always going to be in coffee or maybe a little in my pineapple juice and soup. Uh, soup is really, uh, really good. I've been eating a lot of that lately. That's awesome. Yeah, I should probably switch up my meals. People always ask me, what I eat and it's just simple. It's like meat and potatoes and eggs and cheese. And <laughs> the ours are really simple now. I mean, before, of course, I had a lot of tuna and I was getting in trouble. I was getting symptoms really seriously. And I was wondering, hey, I'm eating healthy here. What's going on? Well, tuna and mayonnaise is what was going on. And I started getting edema, which I'd never had before. 
And uh, finally, I wised up from listening to Ray Peak. And now uh, my one ankle uh, would always be slightly swollen. But every once in a while, I had two episodes where my foot really started getting really large. And uh, I became quite concerned about it. And finally, I realized through Ray Peak that, aha, it's yellow fat disease. And so after that, both ankles are exactly the same size. In fact, the right one almost looks smaller than the other one now. And there's never been a trace of that since. And that's been like five years now before I was having definite problems. You know, it was always uh, on my mind. Be careful how you sit so you don't get uh, fluid in your legs. No more. Wow. I wasn't aware of that. It, like, so edema or swelling can be directly caused by lipofuscin and yellow fat disease. Yep. Is that because... Like it inhibits oxygen and energy production, which then the cells can't make as much water. Kind of Probably idea, so. Or? It's over alkalinity is one of the things. See, uh, a lot of the people who are, you know, alkalinity good, acid bad, don't realize that acidity is life and the alkalinity is the brakes. A chef holds a, a lid on a label, I mean on a pot, so that the acids don't escape. The minerals sink to the bottom. They're not going to escape. They're not going anywhere. That's where the alkaline uh, function is. But the acids, which are very mutable, go floating off in the air. You can change the color of beets and things like that by adjusting the water level from acid to alkaline. In fact, that's a perfect proof to show it. You cook with the lid on and without with like beets, and you'll get a different color of the beets. So obviously some chemical difference is happening from acidity versus alkalinity. Interesting. Yeah, yesterday I just switched out the the battery in my tractor and it's a lead acid battery, right? Batteries are acid. <laughs> that allows them to be conductive. Yeah. Yeah, we are wet cell batteries, but not with lead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the guy that ate Cessnas. <laughs> yeah, they're right. He might he was, he was different, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Um well, I guess we could we could jump into the questions, and then I'm sure we'll have offshoots because uh, we have quite a few. So, um, someone asks, "What's what's one of your weird tips for growing muscle?" Uh, you know, one of them to to grow the muscle in size is to drink a cold glass of water after you do squats and really heavy exercises, and you can gain five pounds, but you can yawn it away, but it's still there. Strength isn't necessarily uh, uh, the same as muscle bulk. In fact, your uh, your uh, power lifters never do the kind of training that a bodybuilder would. They want to get a certain amount of swelling because it looks really, really good on people. And the, the, there's a compromise between the two that is really good. I mean, the guys now, they look like uh, the Incredible Hulk. Guys, uh, I knew a guy, and you can look him up. He was a good friend of mine. Don Peters. He was a former Mr. Universe and things like that. And his career kind of tanked when he uh, when he uh, went up against uh, a guy in the California finals for the Mr. Olympia or Mr. America, whatever it was back then before we got a hold of it. And, uh, and his career kind of sunk. He's uh, in the periphery. But back then, he was big. He worked out with, uh, uh, what is his name? Uh, can't even think of his name now and he'll come back to me but anyway don peters was uh, really built really really well he was one of the best bodybuilders and he was a friend of arnold schwarzenegger till they had a falling out over don's wife so uh i knew don really well and went down to he worked out with him at one time at one time i wanted to be a bodybuilder but then i got sick all this stuff happened probably the tuna fish already and uh, I resumed bodybuilding again and made some progress afterwards. And then I, I got contact with him later. But I figured first I'm going to build up some muscle so he doesn't think I, uh, I, my, uh, I lack. And then he died of liver cancer because he did get into steroids and things. I could tell from the, the bodybuilding books after the fact, after the 60s and 70s, when he was perfectly natural, that, uh, that he had taken steroids and then he died. He was the next door neighbor to Steve Reeves, who was his hero. They both had a horse ranch down there, San Diego, Escondido, I think is the, the town. 
interesting. And so I wonder, because I know a lot of people are on like testosterone replacement therapy, testosterone injections, and uh, human growth hormone. Usually those are combined. Um, but it seems like the testosterone especially is super harmful. And I wonder, like you mentioned liver cancer, I wonder if there's some correlation there with like unresolved lipofuscin in their liver. <laughs> that too. Oh yeah. Li lipofuscin is totally underestimated in the liver. And the liver is so powerful. In my latest uh, issue of Turd Eye, that's my colon newsletter, uh, there's an amazing study that was done, oh, 100 years ago or so. Uh, they took liver cells and put nicotine. Nicotine in cigarettes is a very small amount, so it doesn't really harm you. But nicotine in the garden is a deadly poison when you add just a little bit to it. But if you combine liver cells with nicotine, you can inject it in an animal and it won't die. But any other cell in the human body, you combine it with nicotine, the animal's dead. So they knew back then that liver was very, very important. And once you have that toxified, everything else is downhill. It's a downhill slide. And you have the alcoholic uh, liver disease, which is the fat, which actually is the alcohol causing it. And I'm sure toxic fats are involved. And almost all of the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, guess what? Lipofuscin. Yeah, I... It's funny when I got into health, I was green juicing and doing the whole raw vegan thing, and my skin kind of got better. But at this point in my life, like people commented on it every day. Um, I know it's on like social media, but I don't use those filters and stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you're glowing and blah blah blah. I'm like, well, that's cool. You know, I maybe it's the coffee because coffee is so good for the liver, right? <laughs> it is. It's amazing what a, a liver medicine is. It it brings down. I've looked at the statistics carefully. And first, when coffee was being attacked, I went to a medical library and I tried to find the goods on it. Well, all I found was good stuff. The only test they found that there was a 1% increase in bladder cancer. And guess what? It turned out to be they were making the coffee with fluoridated water. <laughs> so really, there's nothing really bad in uh, caffeine, even over capitalization. You really have to have six or seven or eight cups of coffee because before you really suffer from caffeinism and four or five i usually do the equivalent three or four four coffee yeah. probably most of it in the morning because the circadian rhythms work better that way when you uh you when you're awake you actually want to increase your cortisol in the morning because mm -hmm. you heighten the spike and then lower it later it's not necessary so you don't want to you don't want to flatten the curve to use that expression on cortisol. You want it high in the morning, not too high because people die of it. Ray Pete is right. Put something in your mouth before you go to sleep. I always do, and if I wake up in the middle of the night, right away, grab a little sugar, even a little sugar and a tiny bit of coffee, whatever it is, and then I go to sleep on it. Wow. Too much, and That's I wake big... up and I start working on blogs and books. <laughs> <laughs> two in the morning. <laughs> This is kind of a random question for you. Like I, I use a sleep tracker thing, but like an aura ring, it's pretty popular in like the biohacking space. And um, it tracks like your, your REM sleep in hours and minutes, like how much REM and how much deep sleep. And what's Ooh. interesting is, yeah, my, my rapid eye movement's always much higher than my deep sleep. Uh, well, not much higher, maybe like 30 minutes more. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I've heard before that REM is more, about the brain regeneration and deep sleep is more body. Is that kind of your it's understanding? Or? True. Yeah. Uh, delta sleep between one and four cycles uh, per second uh, actually is very good for the body regeneration. That's why it's early. Usually people dream later. People usually dream about six times a night, six periods a night, only they, don't, they only remember the ones toward dawn. It goes into the temporary memory. You ever think, uh, oh, I'll remember this dream. And then when you wake up, oh, my God. I used to write down my dreams uh, consistently. And to collect them through the night, I would set an alarm clock for every two hours and then wake up. But the sleep mechanism is protected so much. One time, I, the alarm went off. I wrote down my dreams and then realized I dreamed I wrote down the dreams. <laughs> I'm looking <laughs> for my notes and they're not there.
Yeah, uh, dreams are really interesting, and I even experience with uh, what they call astral projection, and uh, it's uh, really a type of, uh, well, our consciousness can leave our body. Right? Guaranteed, guaranteed that can happen, and it's happened to me many times, and I know other people who have uh, I've had interesting reactions with them and interesting stories from trusted friends who have told me stories too. Rupert, yeah, I Rupert Sheldrake type of stuff. Mm -hmm. I think I've seen his TED talk. Yeah, it's he, they got banned or whatever. <laughs> yeah, they took him off a uh, TED talk supposedly. <laughs> he's uh, yeah, he's it, in trouble with uh, what's the guy Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins mm -hmm. always wants to set him up for a total mechanical model of the universe. Well, he came to his house and right away he realized what was happening, so he evicted him from his house. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I had a really short atheist period in my life, which is unbelievable because I've had so many supernatural experiences happen in my childhood. It only lasted like two weeks, I think, when I was like atheist. But I, I bought his book and I think I got through like a quarter of it. <laughs> yeah, I've had a, a lot of really strange things have happened. In fact, right now, interesting enough, I've been, uh, we've been, we saw a documentary about Michael Jackson and how he was set up here in Santa Barbara for a child, uh, 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 all the all the bad stuff what you can do to children, and uh, and just at the time we're interested in it, we're listening to the documentary and a whole bunch of other uh, concerts and things. Suddenly, it turns out that uh, he the ranch gets sold. It just was sold here. Uh, at the time, we started getting interested in it, and a guy oh. named uh, Burke, I believe, was his name, bought it. He was a close friend. And he bought it for a song, $22 million now in uh, Montecito is re really, well, in this area, in the county, it's really cheap to get a ranch when it was up for sale for $100 million, uh, back in May of uh, 2015. So wow. he got some kind of deal because the real estate market is hot here. All the stars in Hollywood, big wigs and DuPont type of people, they're all coming here buying three houses at a time and stocking up and flipping real estate. It's uh, because they don't want to be in L.A. where it's uh, really, uh, really bad right now with all the COVID stuff. Yeah, I think I was part of the mass migration out of California last year, 2020. Um, or was it, I guess, 2019? Yeah. Um, but the last two years, really. And uh, I feel safe up here. I like being more off the grid. But I like, I think you made a Facebook comment the other day saying like, no more being off grid. You have to be a participant. Um, I guess for me, it's like social media participation. <laughs> well, the good thing is what you are is you're the more you can be more off the grid. But a lot of people aren't really off the grid when they get off the grid. It's not just about uh, uh, it's about media, too. It's not just about physical spacing anymore because we're we're dealing with surveillance now. The only thing I think that's going to really stop the Great Reset is some kind of a a planetary tragedy or catastrophe here, unfortunately, because people, uh, you ever seen, I think it's the Ames test where they put people together and uh, one person is a legitimate subject and you have three or four other people in the group and they show uh, some lines. Some of them are even and some of them are uneven. And everybody in the room swears that this line is equal to this line and they're not clearly. But when everybody says they change their mind, even first, they're really confused, like, what the heck? And all those candid camera things where people come into a room and they, uh, uh, a person just stands up on cue and then sits down or even takes off their clothes and the other person comes in and just starts doing it with no explanation or anything, just follows the crowd. So there really is a mob mind. They call it the cloud mind. And Silicon Valley knows how to utilize it, too. Uh, so many people, it's not really a conspiracy, except at the very top. The people just follow along. They figure these people are experts. They must know what they do. So disintermediation, where you separate yourself from the expert and do it yourself. Even though it called it convivial therapy. Like your car now is such a thing that it's hard to work on. I used to change my oil, my my uh, transmission fluid, even my brakes. Now try it. You know, I, I wouldn't know what to do. There's a computer hooked up into everything or or they don't leave enough room underneath the car to get to it, all kinds of things. 
They give you a jack that can collapse instead of a real solid one. They give you a donut tire instead of a real tire. On and on what they do to make it hard on people where you've got to go to an expert. You can't do it yourself. That's a great point. Have you, have you seen the video where uh, everyone's in an elevator and everyone's in there with their arms folded and then someone walks in that's not a part of it and eventually they'll fold their arms with the other. Yes, you know, I, I, I have <laughs> seen those. There's a lot of them out there and it just shows the psychology of people. Now, some of it's good. You want to follow the mores, but, but then you get a bad meme out there and then pretty soon you can do anything you want with people, the people who are in control. Otherwise, you know, if I yawn, you might yawn or someone else might yawn in the room. And that's kind of a social interaction that's uh, natural. We are uh, convivial people. We, are, we like to congregate. And, of course, that's why they want people separated nowadays. I won't go into that too much because I don't want you to get, get the trouble with Facebook. Uh, but anyway, it's, uh, it's a lot of mind control is used. They shut down psychiatry with MK Ultra, put it into drugs. Before that, they didn't use drugs in psychiatry or psychology, and there was a lot of good issues there. But once they did that, the psychiatrists now work for the establishment, and they use it on people, use it as a weapon against people. Well, before, it could be used for people. The managers were particularly good at that, at, uh, at showing how, uh, how psychiatry could work. And even manager's brother was a general in the army and the uh, they found that one quarter of army problems were were psychosomatic they were actually brought about by the physical body and and by the way when i use psychosomatic it means they really had problems but it was brought about by the mind psychological is when you think you have a problem but you really don't but psychosomatic is when your mind makes a problem in your body and that's a very valid uh thing they try to hide that now wow yeah with convid a lot of people have been telling me they lose their sense of uh smell and taste um and that i wonder if just because that meme got out there that people are creating it or if it's legitimate i guess we'll never know <laughs> yeah a lot of it uh you know you can actually mineralize your body with your own mind like right now uh most of your audience if they do this particular thing Stick their tongue out and pretend they're licking a screen. They'll start to taste the screen, even though they can be out in the woods someplace or where there's not a screen in miles away. But they can taste the screen because the smell has gotten to them before, gone into their brain, and it actually moves the minerals in their body. The movement of minerals is just as important as putting it in your body because it has to it's just a dead mineral otherwise it goes in your body unless it moves mobilizes and goes to a particular area for a particular function it becomes useless wow That's where our that mind makes... so important <laughs> <laughs> yeah that makes sense um going back to the great reset for a second this might be a little heavy for the start but it's fine <laughs> 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 like you mentioned, uh, yeah, you had a good point. You said that you feel like a big catastrophe probably has to happen for the Great Reset. And it's funny now, like after last year on a personal level, I'm just like, I'm giving up trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future because I feel like that's a big source of stress. And I have a lot of friends or people that I follow that think they have it all figured out. Like there's going to be definitely a fake alien invasion mm -hmm. to cover up. A rapture that's going to happen to cut you know it's like on and it's like a sequence and they know every step i'm like do you really <laughs> I don't know. time will tell on that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I just feel like nobody knows what's going to happen and that's okay but i don't know <laughs> there is a certain amount of awakening now where people are starting to get wise uh, like here in california there are now some protests uh they have a petition to take uh Newsom out of office. I don't think anything's going to come of it, but it is there. And I have an article right here. Uh, finally, it was printed in the paper, the local paper. They have been totally pro-vaccine, pro-everything all along. And then this guy comes in with this big article that they featured, Warp Speed Vaccine, you go first. <laughs> and it's really very interesting by a guy named Dale Lattermill. 
that we're going to look up. So there are some people, but because we're in a bubble, uh, you know, uh, with our friends and things, we think uh, we think that everybody is uh, waking up, and actually, it's only a small group because other people out there still are afraid, legitimately, or they they they've been told they're fearful. Now we live in an isolated part of Montecito. It's a uh, way out in the Tuleys, up in the hill. And the road I walk on is a private road for about a mile. No one else is supposed to be here, though bicyclists occasionally come through. through. Every, every couple of days, maybe someone drives through without trouble. But I went out to walk and look at the view today. And, and coming back, I encounter a guy, and he's got a face mask on, walking. There's not a soul in sight, except here I am. When he sees me, he goes way to the other side of the road. He's friendly and everything. I wave at him. We say hello. But it was so interesting how instinctively he moved way away from me because I didn't have a mask on. So many people are in just this state of fear, and they just believe what people are saying, that there's something out there killing people at an inordinate rate, and it's really not happening. Do you think a lot of these seeds were planted like in the 70s and 80s or even 90s? to be like germaphobic because I grew up in my, you know, uh, my mother, you know, not to bag on her. <laughs> she had, I think she got over it over years, but you know, I was raised around a little bit of some germaphobia kind of thoughts and stuff. And um, I think eventually some people get over it, but I feel like for some, the seed was planted so deep and then now it's like in full bloom. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I had uh, parents that were really cleansing, you know, especially my mother, you know, she'd come, we'd have to dust while she was at work, and she'd come along with her hand and on the windowsill with her finger, and aha, you didn't dust that enough, that kind of stuff. So I went into that, but I, to break out of it, I would actually put food on the floor and eat it off the floor to, uh, to break myself. I still am a bit of a germaphobic, but... I didn't die from doing all that stuff. <laughs> and as kids, God, I'm, my mother came out one time. I'm on the porch as a little baby. I don't remember this. And I'm holding half a caterpillar. I'd ate half of the caterpillar. And I seem to have survived that too. An insectivore <laughs> right at the beginning. I mean, because certain like a uh, herpes simplex, is it one or something, could be transmitted through saliva and like if i if we shared like a mexican coke and i say here adam have a sip i mean we could transmit right <laughs> it can be uh the terrain theory is really popular now but i'm sorry i'm just not buying into it samuel weiss was a hungarian who uh saved many lives by uh by people being uh you know being infected during operations before and they thought he was crazy he uh, eventually went into the nut house because he couldn't handle uh, what he knew was true and everybody else was against. So it's not really with Pasteur. And also, if you take uh, terrain theory to its maximum, uh, 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 Bouchamp believed it was viruses, bacteria, fungi, and, and amoeba. So they don't tell you that part. If you read his book, no one re reads the book. I go back and read the books and what he actually said. So he believed you can make yogurt in a vacuum. You don't need any bacteria. It's spontaneous. So the people, there's no endosomes if you have terrain, terrain theory because they're from gram-negative bacteria. So how can that be a poison then? Uh, I take a middle stand. There's a guy named Bouchard out of France. And he said that if you have a colon that isn't moving, then you have uh, like a slow moving stream, you're going to collect bacteria and viruses. That makes sense. Kellogg of the uh, Kellogg San Sanitarium and the breakfast food Kellogg, he went by that and was a very big fan of Bouchard. And I, be I believe that or immunity, you can, uh, some people, we get a cold five times a year, but most people don't even know it. And they actually help us. They really do help us. They help us build our immunity. Now, by giving all these vaccines and everything else, they are compromising the herd immunity. And they've actually changed the definition. Before, herd immunity was everybody gets it and then it's okay. Now, they've changed the definition to 
everybody is vaccinated and now they have immunity. That's a huge difference taking the terminology. If you change the definition of words, you get a whole different meaning and everybody henceforth is gonna read that definition in medical school, in college, and they're gonna believe that story when, you know, just as of about a month ago, there was an entire definition that was different. Wow. Yeah. Whenever I go to the store to buy a uh, Amish butter, I'm always shocked at how many are still left because I feel like if people knew the power of like vitamin A and copper for the immune system, then, you know, before going to a vaccine, they would go to like, you know, good butter. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things. One of the really curious things is a lot of people don't realize that the vitamin D that they sell is very toxic. That's why, have you noticed? If you put something on YouTube about vitamin C will will be beneficial for COVID, you'll get deplatformed eventually. But if you put vitamin D, they stalk you with vitamin D now. I, you've been on YouTube lately, you can't get away from it. Vitamin D for COVID, vitamin D for COVID. Why suddenly would the establishment and YouTube and Google want you to take vitamin D? Well, we get vitamin D out of the sun. And you can even get it when it's low on the horizon. How did they get it in Alaska, for God's sake, before there were supplements? You think they needed it? And, oh, okay, uh, you get it from, uh, but they get it from uh, mammals. Oh, so those mammals swim all the way down to the equator and all the way back at night so that the Eskimos can get their vitamin D because they have to be exposed to the sun. Oh, but the mammals eat it from the krill. Oh, so the krill fly all the way down to the equator, come all the way back so they can eat it. Well, the krill get it from the algae. So the algae takes a jet plane down to the tropics, gets its vitamin D from the sun and comes back up. What's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good point. Yeah, I like um, Jim Stevenson Jr. I think he's been censored quite a bit on Facebook, but he puts out constant information about uh, hormone D and the detriment of supplementing it. And um, it, it gets so complex. I think there's like 25 different forms of hormone D. And most people are focusing on like the 25, which is the storage form and not the active form, which is 125D, which most people are not low in. So they're like looking at the wrong one and they're supplementing the wrong one. <laughs> exactly. And they look in the wrong place. They look in the blood. It's a fat-soluble vitamin. Why would it be in a water-soluble blood? It's in the fat. That's where it hangs out. And that's why back in the day, they worried about submariners. They're going to be down there for three months without any sunshine should they have supplements. And they tested them without any. They were fine. Nature has a way of having you survive the winter over the time. And so it did it. And uh, But now, suddenly... The, the Navy needs vitamin D and all of those tests are discarded and suddenly they have new tests that they come in. I just don't trust any of these tests anymore because whatever they want, suddenly the test validates it. Yeah. And I think the guy that popularized the vitamin D test profited significantly about, uh, I can't remember his name, but he was connected to the vitamin D supplement industry. And since then, because the patent ran out, they uh, actually, uh, now all the types are actually genetically made. They don't tell you that part either. In fact, the organization that started that was the University of Wisconsin. And it was a big scandal because they actually started uh, the patenting where the, where the university could hold the patent on a vitamin and get the profit on it when it was supported by taxpayers. Why didn't they get a share of that? But... But they started the thing, supposedly, I've even seen, I think, Ray Pete or others claim that that happened, the patenting law was changed in the 80s. But no, it was changed in the 30s, a long time ago. I have it. I, I wrote a book on vitamin D, and I have that uh, information in it. The University of Wisconsin, which started the whole thing of patenting uh, and making money. People have no idea how much money these universities have, like Harvard. Harvard has so much money. If you see a guy named Patrick Bed David, he did an expose on Harvard and all the money they really have. And then they get donations on top of that. But meanwhile, they are bucks up to, to an extreme. 
Wow. <laughs> billions. They um, have billions. Yeah, I always question. I think the resveratrol thing made sense to me that it was a scam when I saw all these major universities pushing it. I'm like, okay, if these universities are pushing resveratrol super hard, it's probably good to question it. <laughs> you know, because uh, Andy mounted his horse and rode off in all directions is my uh, category. When I go to libraries, I start at A in the magazines and end up at Z. So I go through all of them and thumb through them. Well, I happen to get a Vintner's magazine. And they were laughing about people who take resveratrol. Said it, it only appears for a flash. It's there for a day at the most, and it's gone. So obviously, they said they can't be getting resveratrol. Well, anyone can go on the internet and check out the patents. There's numerous patents on resveratrol. It's a patented drug. It's a GMO. And it's a nanotech in many cases. And it's fluorinated. See, fluorinated is fluoridated. But if you look at fluoridated, you're not going to find it. So they changed it to fluorinated drugs. 20%, maybe 25% now of all drugs are fluorinated. They have fluorine in them. And they wow. hidden the fact by simply putting an N and Google misses the search. Put fluorinated, you're in, people will be in for a real surprise. That's like alpha lino. <laughs> Linolenic and linoleic, right? It's kind of like that. Yeah, that, there's the big one. Even biotech uh, uh, journals miss that. They, I, you can find it easily. Anybody can go in and say, in fact, I have a friend that was a microbiologist, and I kind of played a trick on her because she believes in the, the COVID and everything, and, and she has a degree in microbiology. So I said, it's uh, the problem is linolenic acid. Well, I get a big thing back about, you think linoleic acid is really that bad? And goes on and on and on about that. And, and I said, I didn't say linoleic acid. I said linolenic acid. And uh, Monsanto went on and on about that. They say it's linoleic, but they know perfectly well that people are going to think it's linoleic, including the biotech journals. The editors make that mistake. When they check it over, they miss it. Just that in the first show I did with you, I forgot which one was which myself. You know, make it three and make it six. But when I when I went to think of the name, I couldn't. But now I'll never forget it, thanks to that first show with you. <laughs> I thought, uh oh, <laughs> I don't <Right>. know. <laughs> investigating to make it three, and I don't know the difference of which is which. <laughs> yeah, linoleic is three, linolenic is six, right? That's it. That's it. The okay. end. I remember it by N for no. N for no. Okay. And that's the only one that causes uh, yellow fat disease. I'd never found a case of omega 6s. Now, I, I still stay away from uh, omega 6 because uh, Ray Pete and people I trust say it's really bad. But, but I can't trust mainstream science because look at what they've done with omega 3s, by God. It, you and uh, Ray Pete, myself, who else? A couple others, uh, Danny Roddy, et cetera, et cetera. But there's not many people. And, and they think you're crazy, the, the public, if you're against omega-3s. Oh, it's essential for the brain. It's in the brain. Yeah, because you're eating all that fish oil. Why do you think it's in the brain? Well, I think um, I think you're you're creating tidal waves. I mean, you, you're my big inspiration. And I see, like, prominent carnivores now, even, like, going on Joe Rogan. and But only talking about omega-6s still and seed oils and vegetable oils but they don't dare touch the threes because you know rogan and a lot of those characters are selling it or promoting them and he's very pro uh make it three yeah. yeah he goes on and on about it i've seen him rave about how good fish oil is even though it tastes so bad it's really really good for you yeah that's um it's an issue so uh, that's actually a good segue for these questions we had from people um how much, like, as far as saturated fat and omega threes, because saturated fats will displace the polyunsaturated fats, right? And people are asking, how much saturated fat should one consume per day if they're trying to displace PUFAs? You know, uh, you wouldn't even need any if you could avoid omega threes. But because we can't avoid omega threes, uh, then we need a certain amount. I don't think it's a great amount. Yeah. I get my fats from eggs and cheese and a little uh, a little raw milk once in a while. We get raw, but even Ray Pete is correct that if it's not raw, it's okay. 
The only difference in the babies, it does make a difference. The uh, it, once you pasteurize it, it uh, it doesn't work well. It, they they get constipated with it, baby. But adults, there's very little difference. I've seen the studies from the the 20s and the 30s that were done extensively on it. And Ray Pete apparently is familiar with those studies or other studies because otherwise it's uh, pretty good. Cool. Yeah, dairy is a subject where pe- a lot of people are confused and scared because, you know, lactose intolerance. And um, a lot of people send me pictures of the milk that they can find and all of it's fortified. They're like, Matt, will, is, will this vitamin D in the milk kill me or is it better than nothing? I usually say it's better than nothing, but it's kind of sad that every milk product now pretty much is fortified unless you find like raw milk or whole milk. <laughs> it is. Iron, of course, is one of the worst of all the supplements that they do. People get way too much iron and it's hidden. I finally found, uh, I've kind of avoided pasta, but every once in a while, I like some noodles in my soup. I found one at the health food store that has no minerals added. I don't even know if it's legal for them to do that because the government is uh, on people. They have to fortify it. And that's iron oxide, one of the worst. You know, I, I once, uh, I was taken to see a gentleman that was supposedly dying. He was in his bed. And he said he couldn't go to the bathroom. He was he was a beast anyway. He was totally bedridden. So I was brought there and he said he had a black stool. And just on a hunch, I said, are you taking an iron supplement from a pharmacy. Oh, yeah. I said, that's ferrous sulfate, which is the worst of all of them. The fumarate and sulfate are the worst iron. So I said, You're, are you taking ferrous sulfate? He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, I, I went into his medicine cabinet and found it. It was indeed ferrous sulfate. I said, stop taking this. You'll be fine. He lived. Wow. <laughs> he was dying from ferrous sulfate. And that's, you see, they give you that at pharmacies. To, so you won't go to the health food store. No health food store would have ferrous sulfate. It's just not going to happen. And they only use fumarate usually in black olives. So my second story is the vegetarian vampire. <laughs> I'm at a, uh, a working at a managed a health food store in Austin, Texas, and a guy in a, it was in a mall, and a guy goes walking by dressed like Tom Cruise, you know, in the vampire movie. So we meet eyes. I look at him, he looks at me, and he comes walking up to me and says, I am not a vampire. <laughs> and I said, well, I kind of figured that, but you, you kind of look like the character in the movie. I said, but by the way, you have an iron overload. So that's interesting, uh, it, it, being a vampire. <laughs> and he said, I'm a vegetarian. I can't have an iron overload. I said, yeah, you can get an iron overload from vegetables too. He said, oh, yeah, from what? I said, well, black canned uh, olives. And he said, oh my God, I eat two cans a day. And see, when you get that gray cast, the person's in serious trouble and you can see it. It's a kind of a a gray, maybe tannish bronze look. And at that point, people are really in serious trouble. So, Wow. Yeah. That that term anemia is thrown around so much, right? That it's people don't, think that iron overload is more way more prevalent than anemia. I mean, from my understanding, like less than 1% of people are anemic or even less than half a percent. <laughs> yep. Well, hemoglobin is a lot different. People, When people used to come to the health food store, even back in the 80s, I knew to ask them, do you have iron overload anemia or do you have hemoglobin uh, underload anemia and uh, deficiency anemia? And they didn't know. And they deliberately don't do that because you can be anemic from lack of copper, from lack of cobalt, which is in B12, uh, from several other things. And all of those elements you can be deficient are, are on the fourth row of the periodic table of the elements. You'll notice everything in the blood cell from copper to cobalt to, to even a little nickel is in there. It's, it's actually a growth hormone in tiny, tiny amounts. Uh, they're all in the fourth row of the periodic table of the elements. Yeah, I love on your website, I actually posted that before uh, I started recording that that table that you have on your website, Solar Timings, the, the coolest looking one I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah, it took me a while to, got to I, I got it off of Emmanuel Ravisi's book, and I decided to expand it and put additional information into it, uh, what he was writing in his books. and then. 
I found out that there were in nature. See, things, things uh, form sediments in geology. Gold is going to be at one level until volcanoes bring it out. And, uh, and the same thing happens in the body. We have volcanoes that move things to different places, but they send us, they stratify. Uh, that happens in geology. It happens in the atmosphere. We have uh, different compositions of, of uh, atmosphere, stratosphere, ionosphere, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the body is no different. It actually builds up from a positive and negative charge where you have a proton that's positive, And then as a protection for the proton, it has an electron field around it. Then a molecule, it needs a backyard to protect itself. And then that needs a backyard into your basic histones, etc., on into your chromomatter, chromomere, chromosome, on into the nucleus and then the cell and then the, the organs, and then finally the whole body, and then the whole atmosphere it goes into. It's similar to, uh, I'm, I'm in my body and I need a protection. So I have a house, I have a nice warm house here. Now I need a protection for my neighbors and bandits and whatever. I have a backyard, that's my next level. Then I have a, a neighborhood, and a neighborhood watch maybe. And then I have a community, and then I have a town, and then I have a, uh, a county. And then I have a state, and then I have a nation, and then I have a world. See how it works on levels? This stratification and hierarchy is what Ravisi calls it, is how her body works. And it's almost totally ignored by uh, cancer researchers and anatomy physiologist people. The mainstream medicine ignores that. Wow. Yeah, they just com- compartmentalize things. and. Um, That's why they make the mistake. They look for vitamin D in the blood when it's a a different level. Also, if you get a blood test, are you getting a serum test, uh, a plasma test, or are you getting a cell test, or are you getting a combination of both? And and the ratio between the two makes an important difference on whether you're acid or alkaline. You can tell it from that way. And then people say, well, you can't measure the blood. It's such a slight difference. That's true, because you want to measure the pH in your stomach, in your pancreas, in your kidneys. It's all different. They all vary. And your small intestine is different from your large intestine. And then in the layers of the cell, in, what about inside the organelles? What about inside the DNA? They have different and usually alternate. One is acid, one is alkaline on top to compensate. Acid, alkaline, acid, alkaline. They build on up to the body. And here we have our body moving around. That's actually a community of all these different levels. That's awesome. Yeah. On my street a few weeks ago, right before Christmas, there was a meteor that actually crashed down on like right down the street from me. And wow. uh, I should go hunt it down and, and collect some, uh, some rocks. <laughs> oh, there's money in that. Go, go do it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll eat some of it, get my minerals. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll start glowing. No. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of uh, theories of panspermia that a lot of the minerals that came to the earth and the nutrients and even organic life came from outer space. Uh, it's a viable theory, and I subscribe to it. I think it's true that eventually we came from with panspermia. They have different versions of it, but uh, it's well known that. Uh, the greatest form of life on Earth is actually uh, sulfur-based bacteria and uh, methane-based bacteria. They outnumber the mass of protoplasm on this planet by far, 10 times, I think it is. So wow. where did this come from? It doesn't need oxygen. It uses sulfur and it uses methane in one case. So those are like the deep ocean like vents? Like all the critters down in the deep ocean and stuff. They're in vents, and they also occur in, uh, 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 let's say, Yellowstone Park, places like that, wherever there's heat. And also even in a lot of places where there aren't that. A lot of the, uh, when you fly into San Francisco and you see all those colorful uh, algae looking, a lot of those are actually sulfur-based or methane-based. And they're silicon-based, too, in the form of diatoms. So uh, these uh, could, in other words, life can't exist without oxygen. As Ray P puts it, though, there's one thing it can't live without, carbon dioxide. That makes sense. And you're pretty well <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, someone asked, actually, can you, 
explain the different or the connection between CO2, oxygen, and sugar. Um, they all kind of play with each other, right? Yep. You can get carbon dioxide from a bag or you can get it from sugar. So if you, can, if you don't take sugar, go and do bag breathing. Now, I learned, and Ray Pete doesn't uh, seem to talk about this, but according to my mentor, Adonal Lay, you want to do the bag breathing at night uh, because at night you have a heart attack that's too much oxygen and during the day it's too much carbon dioxide. So you want more carbon dioxide at night to keep an over oxygenated. We see we go in cycles, just like there's night and day. Our body is can, goes into acid, acid and alkaline. It gets maximum alkalinity, especially if you move around uh, by midday, and then you generate acidity through carbon dioxide. Here's a perfect example. If I breathe really quickly, like in those. Uh, 60s and 70s rebirthing sessions, you know, <laughs> like that you breathe, you get tetany, you lock up in paralysis like that, and you're, you get cramps, although many cramps are from over oxygenation. Uh, but if I go breathe really slowly, I go into a coma because the lack of oxygen makes coma. Meditation makes you comatose. That's the idea behind it. And at night, when you go into a deep sleep, particularly in a delta brainwave, you regenerate. Now, I, I studied with a man who didn't sleep, but he knew how to put the carbon dioxide in his body in the middle of the day. He basically was in delta, but he could be awake while he was in delta. And we have some image. Sometimes that happens through uh, sleepwalking. Sleepwalking doesn't happen in the theta brainwave because in theta, so you don't punch the person you're sleeping with, you paralyze your muscles. So that's called in yoga the, uh, uh, basically it's the, the immobile state of, uh, of meditation. But then you can go to the place beyond where the environment moves you and you get sleepwalking. There's a famous case of a, a wife who followed a husband and she saw him walking across a, a, a little plank over a raging river. And she screamed at him because she was afraid. He he woke up and he realized in his waking state he couldn't balance, so he fell and drowned. So a okay. tragic story, but it shows how we can do things under mesmeric states like that that we can't do normally. And sleepwalkers often do things like walk around railings and do things they would never dream of doing because the fear and imagination of like walking on a plank in a 20-story building would uh, make them afraid. The American Indians seem to have avoided that. That's why they hired them al almost exclusively to build the skyscrapers in New York. The Indians, for some reason, didn't have it in their consciousness to be afraid of those heights. Wow. Yeah, there's a really good documentary I watched years ago where the guy uh, shot something across the Twin Towers when they were still up and walked across. Uh, it's yeah, like a French right? guy. <laughs> Some of those people are amazing on the, the, the Walanskins or whatever their name is. You know, they did a, over Niagara Falls and they put one guy was on a bicycle on the line and he had a person on his shoulders who was a brave person to ride on the back of someone riding a bicycle. And he made it over Definitely. Niagara Falls. They would have contests who could do the most ridiculous thing, walk on your hands, on the wire, do this and that. And... Uh, wow. Uh, yeah, a lot of those people ended up in tragedies and working without a net, but many of them survived and uh, and did it. Perfect uh, balance. So I have wow. trouble. I used to practice on the railroad tracks as a kid. You know, walk the railroad tracks for miles and jump from one to another. That's the <laughs> furthest I've ever gotten to. Uh, I tried wire walking, just wasn't working for me. But you got to do it. You got to do it yeah. a lot. I think it's really good for your balance to do that. Yeah, I think next summer I'm going to set it up. I used to do it at my, my first apartment. My neighbor, my complex was super into it. So we'd spend an hour or two out, out in the yard with the tr two trees and t walking. I forget the slack lining. That's what it's called. Yeah. Yep. I think that's, uh, the only tried that, the time I tried that was at Swami's Beach down there where you used to live in that area uh, in uh, Encinitas, I guess it is. And they have a park there and they had uh, that wire set up. So I tried it. I didn't do very well. <laughs> but you have to practice. Yeah, it seems like there's a lot of brain stuff involved with that one. 
Um, it, it actually increases uh, the size of your pineal gland because a lot of people don't realize that the pineal is heavily involved with balance. They have little calcium uh, iceberg, uh, uh, what do you call it? No, Iceland uh, spar that's clear in your brain that are also in your ear. They're called otoliths. And so pineal has a lot to do with balance, as does the inner ear. We have a we have a third ear as well as a third eye. Wow, that's interesting. <laughs> um, since we we brought up sleep, I wanted to ask you about uh, astral projection that we talked about a little bit ago. Because uh, several years ago, I had like what I would say is forced astral projection. Like for years, I was trying to do it and I couldn't, and then I started having involuntary to where. Like my consciousness would be in my kitchen, but my body would still be in the bed, and it would happen a couple times a week for several months. Um, have you heard of that? Or yeah, stress can do it. In fact, most people, it's common in surgeries where a person who doesn't believe in any of this, they're suddenly up in the ceiling looking down on themselves. I have a very good friend, by the way, that Donna Lake did a session on, and she left her body, and she's up in the ceiling. So when she did that. Adana Lay walked away from her, waved up at the ceiling and said, come back anytime. <laughs> well, it makes sense because I was doing one meal a day, like one hour a day kind of eating window. So I was full keto, you know, full vegan, uh, eating a lot of soy and beans. So a ton of PUFAs. I was supplementing omega-3s. So stress makes sense. <laughs> yeah, stress is the usual method, uh, you know, it often happens to younger people and probably my son, my own son, the same caveman, the strong guy, he uh, left home early. Uh, I got divorced and they were like four years old or so when they went on to different fathers. And he left uh, the stepfather's home when he was 16, looked big, so he got a job and things like that. But at one point, uh, his mother phoned him up on the phone and he went to answer it and he could hear her and she couldn't hear him. So he hung the phone up, waited until he called back. Still couldn't hear him. So then he called back and she answered the phone and couldn't hear him. So he turns around to go back to bed with a darn phone company, you know, the heck with it. He turns around, his body's on the bed. Now he freaks out. So he thinks, I'm going to go in the bathroom and look in the mirror. <laughs> but then that frightened him. So he said, he got back in his body and he said he seemed to know how to do it. And his body jumped up about a foot off the bed when it did. And he ran to the phone and called his mother. And uh, indeed, she had called him twice. No one answered. And then the phone had rang and she had picked it up and no one was on the line. So to me, uh, he had a couple other experiences like that. And according to what I've learned, it happens particularly with people that are uh, in so-called adolescent ages, where it's, uh, it's actually associated with a mother trauma which very likely could be going on at the time since he had left home and probably blamed his mother for uh, for living with the guy that, that wasn't treating him quite nice enough. Wow. Interesting. Huh. But that's, that, that's, that's, that's the, the uh, I've seen uh, other astral projection things, had some experiences myself, but uh, that that's the, uh, the best one I've ever heard from home son. That's pretty cool. Yeah. I was, I was curious because there are there are a lot of movies that put a lot of fear into it. Like I don't know if you've heard of like Insidious, um, that's like the a popular one. There's a series. I think there's like four or five of those movies out, similar to like Paranormal Activity that had like you know series and sequels. Um, but the Insidious one is basically about like natural astral projection, like a family, but it turns demonic and scary and they get harmed and all this. <laughs> so, the movies used to like to do that. I like the. Uh... The ones that are more uh, that people don't die. Uh, what was it? Flatliners. You ever seen that movie? To no. me, that is such a good movie. Nobody dies in it. the original Flatliners. I haven't seen the new one, and they'll probably mess it up. Keeper Sutherland, uh, Kevin Bacon, uh, Julia Roberts, uh, uh, Platt. What's his name? Oliver Platt. Oh, what a what a great movie, and it. It shows how your conscience can affect you because they have these near-death experiences that go back to their childhood. I find that movie particularly interesting, and particularly it's a Hollywood movie where nobody dies. What the heck? 
I ruined you like, a, a spoiler here for people who are going to see that movie now who haven't seen it. But you like Final Destination, right? <laughs> oh, I love that movie, even though it's very negative, but uh, it has a lot to do with how how our lives are kind of planned out in advance and how we can beat the system, though, which has always been fascinated. It led me to Gurdjieff and other people who realize how unconscious the world really is. Uh, we operate on a very unconscious level, the conscious mind, uh, the weird decisions. And I can give you countless examples of that of people who say, oh, my parents didn't affect me at all. But like I have a good friend. He He's born in Texas. He feels compelled to move to the San Diego. Area. He hooks up, up with a nurse that he's in the longest relationship he's been in. His mother was a nurse in the Navy in San Diego. And I've seen over and over, I can, I can just count the stories of people who think, oh, I moved here of my own free will. What a coincidence are they? You're duplicating it. My own son followed me when we were separated. He was living in the apartment that I lived in at one time following me. Then I wanted to move to Oregon. He moved to Oregon and then he moved to Washington because I was going to move there after stopping in San Jose, which was the place I stopped on the way and duplicated my life to such an exact degree that at one time I had a girlfriend that bought me a pair of designer jeans and he doesn't wear them, but because his girlfriend bought him a pair of black designer jeans, the same brand, we they bought them on the same day for both of us without us knowing about it. Those kind of synchronicities make you really wonder what our connection is with other people. Yeah, uh, here in Idaho, I meet so many people that moved from Southern California and specifically even San Diego, exactly where I came from. <laughs> like, it's just amazing that all the people gravitated up to Idaho, like of all places. <laughs> they have from Austin, too, interesting enough. There's a guy up there that lives in a tower. He built a tower from scratch with a spiral staircase going up four stories from a basement is the first statement to a watchtower. And he flies around in one of those ultralight planes. He's a really interesting character. And you ever run into him? Really interesting guy. I'll look for his plane. <laughs> I don't remember his name, but I was fascinated with that house. Yeah, really cool. That's pretty awesome. Yeah, I got a, a telescope for Christmas. Uh, that's all I asked for. So I, I'm interested in, in looking up and seeing stuff. And it's one of those little computerized ones. So I'm excited to set that up this week and check out up in Idaho. because It'll be a lot clearer than Southern California. Yeah, as a kid, I was fascinated with, uh, in fact, moving to California, the big thing was Mount Wilson to me because I was in the Bergen County Astronomical Association at 11 years old. We had the largest refractive uh, telescope in the country. And so I got to see Saturn up close and the rings and the asteroids and Jupiter and the moon, the craters and everything. Very exciting. I was really, I wanted to be an astronaut, but then I was told, you got to know math. And I'm not too, <laughs> it really just depressed me in the fourth grade. You got to know math. Now you're a, a psychonaut, right? Isn't that what they call it? Yeah, now I'm a psychonaut, you know. Uh, oh, well, at least I'm something. I, to me, I'll astro project there, but that looks like about it now. My chances of going to the moon are zero, zilch, nada. You can go with Elon Musk. All right, yeah, he's going. He's probably smart. <laughs> you know, he, he's not only moving out of California, he's moving there. By the way, even Larry Ellison now is out of here. But he has he has two or three homes here in Santa Barbara. But he moves his business uh, there because they like to live here because the scenery is here. That's one thing nice about California that I, I love the scenery along the beach. But uh, the government now absolutely sucks. Yeah, yeah, it's insane what um, what's going on. I I'm kind of glad to be out and uh, yeah, I'm always telling friends if you need a break, come up and visit me. <laughs> They're a little mellower here in Santa Barbara, and there are protests now, and they won't fine you for wearing a mask. They educate you and hand you a mask. Uh, last I heard, but you know, it changes. It changes every uh, every day. You never know what you're doing if you're doing something illegal or not. Yeah, I heard my one of my friends, Todd. He was out in the water, it, um, and they 
yelled at him that he wasn't wearing a mask in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> they actually dragged a surfer in. He was way out there. They dragged him in for not wearing a mask. I don't know if they find him or not, but we have a surfer friend that goes out anyway. He just waits till no one's watching. He's out there all the time. He, he lives in the ocean almost every day of the year he's out there. Wow. Yeah, I really miss scuba diving. Some Someday I have to... I'm trying to stay away from Seattle, but I know there's a lot of good diving there. So I want to do a trip out there and you know spend a day and go out there in the, in the cold right. water. You, you scuba dive, yeah. Yeah, I used to clean tanks and inspect them. And uh, wow. I, I was almost going to be a dive in, uh, instructor. I was like that into it. But there's just it feels like you're on another planet when you're down there. It's, I went down once, once because my friends are scuba divers. They would go to Hawaii and I'd go with them into the Cayman Islands and things like that. Uh, and I was supposed to go, but things happened where I never got officially uh, registered. So uh, I ended up going down once because the diver said, oh, let's take this guy down for a half hour. And it really is an amazing world down there. Amazing. Yeah, I want to try different gases to breathe because I know, I think I almost got like a nitrogen certification because you could like bump up the nitrogen percentage that you breathe. I, just, I thought that was really cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can. T the gases are interesting. In fact, pressure diseases like weight has a lot to do with pressurization. If you grow a whale in captivity, it'll stay small. But when you go down in the water, it activates the fat cells. And a lot of people don't realize that much of what we call weight is just gas pressure. Because when you lose the weight, where does it go? 84% goes out the nose. That's carbon dioxide. And 14% goes out as oxygen, I mean, as, as water. And that goes out either as sweat or you breathe it out, one or the other. So we're really gas. If you take a, a redwood tree and punch it, you'll break your hand. And yet, that tree is completely composed of carbon dioxide out of the air and water out of the ground. And uh, completely, because otherwise, if it needed the minerals and the nutrients out of the soil, It'd be a big hole in the ground. Forests would grow holes in the ground, but it gets it completely out of the air. And is that, weight is the same thing. As hard as that fat seems, as solid as it is, it's gas. Is that why they say, like, on the moon, we weigh, you know, weigh differently, and on different planets, Mars, we'd weigh differently? Uh, it, it, would it would change our geometry uh, dramatically. If we go to different gravitational poles, we will change the shape of what we look like. Uh, I was very interested in space travel, obviously, but at the level of Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, Captain Video and his Video Rangers, I had my ring and all of it. Uh, now I, I follow it. Uh, I think NASA is actually sabotaging us. One of the things I do approve uh, Trump doing uh, is making a, a fifth uh, category of the armed forces, the space forces. Because I really believe eventually we'd better get off this planet because uh, we're, we're in a shooting gallery. Look what happened to the, uh, what was the name of that uh, shoemaker, Levi, Comet, or all those uh, big meteorites or comets hit Jupiter and made this huge secondary spot there? If, if that had hit Earth, no more Earth, you know. And look at the Barringer Crater, uh, the huge crater in Russia. The Gulf of Mexico was a crater from something hit. This affected life on Earth and probably wiped out the dinosaurs. So uh, we're always in danger here. And I think we have the capacity to go to other planets and do that. So Elon Musk, I'm, I'm for his science. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the Manhattan uh, Project. That was hidden for, what, seven years or so before people didn't know until the bomb went off in Japan. All that was hidden. and. Uh, they had, to, they had to make excuses to get all the extra fluoride, all the extra uranium, and all of those they made excuses for, and everybody believed it again. But uh, there's a lot of hidden science. And right now, they've actually mastered the electron field, and they can make, uh, they can make iron out of anything or calcium out of any other element in their field. People have no idea what they've done with nanotechnology. They had this technology. They called them Adam Smiths. It's in Discover Magazine in the 1990s. After that, they realized they didn't want to let the public know. And now it's hard to hear that kind of information, what nanotechnology really is. I can take sand 
and make it into any element to paint my house with and leave the paint on there for that's impregnated into the into the wood or whatever material for centuries. But of course they're not going to release that because Sherwin Williams will go out of business. <laughs> they have they have techniques now of doing these kind of things. And, and a lot of it's dangerous. We don't know if we're going to get the gray goo that uh various people have warned us about in their books and uh and it, it, and if a lot of this nanotechnology actually is like computerized, they actually have the ability to do that now. IBM, all of these companies have this. There are secret programs usually involved with the government in things like 6G, not 5G, but 6G. And uh, anyway, we have the first uh, quantum computer from Google right up the street from us here, probably about 15 miles away. Wow. When I moved up here, I went to the library and I, I saw my first 3D printer and they were showing me all the little plastic things they made from it. <laughs> and wow. that's kind of wild. Like, I mean, you could build a house with that supposedly or guns or um, I want to build like an anti-gravity saucer with that. That'd printer. be cool. I have to admit, uh, the guy who supposedly invented an anti-gravity machine, what is his name? He's out of uh, Vancouver. Uh, mm. He took a workshop of mine because he was he was on the lam from the Canadian government. The Canadian government uh, said that it was nonsense that he had an anti-gravity machine until Germany and Japan were bidding for the machine from him. And then they, they confiscated his lab, put a warrant out for his arrest, his arrest and he was, he was hiding out in a Bellingham Indian reservation when I met him. And the only reason he took my workshop, and I actually worked on it as a client, is because he, uh, he, the car broke down in front of the place where I was doing the workshop. So it was kind of faded. So he said, well, I might as well take your workshop. So, <laughs> so he took the workshop. The Huntington Effect, what is his name? John Johnson. Oh, I know. Was he, did he live in like a crazy apartment and he had some TV specials made about him? He's had, I think, he's had, I think it's John Hutchinson, if I've got that yeah. right. And they actually call it the Hutchinson effect. And he has, uh, uh, I'm not sure how valid his theories are, but he was a very intelligent man. And uh, I think he's on to something, really into the alternative energy, quantum energy, uh, different things like that. Hutchinson, John Hutchinson, that's his name. You'll find him on YouTube. Yeah, it's funny. I just watched like a little mini documentary about him. Uh, I think it was kind of like a show like Ripley's Believe It or Not or something. But he had all his radios and all the things going, all his experiments in his tiny apartment. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he was on the lamp at that point. He was hiding out with the Indians with, uh, I forget the name of the, uh, I made another friend, Lisa Van Noyen or something like that, that, uh, that I took a workshop and that's how I got to meet him. But he's a wonderful guy, really really nice and he sounded legitimate to me he actually had this machine where you could actually float above it by uh i forget it was a big a big machine he had built in vancouver now uh i think because of the financial problems he has a smaller laboratory he's got all these gadgets in his place uh, i'm i'm sure it's the same guy hutchinson yeah that's what i'm most excited about for the future is like transportation because i feel like people underestimate how that how much that would change things it's like it's such a journey for me to get on a plane and spend a day to get down to see my family and friends that imagine mm -hmm. in 10 seconds you know <laughs> or something well the thing i like to do is drive and uh <laughs> that's the thing that they want to discourage now because at uh, one time i have actually driven for uh, a day straight without sleeping and i needed i would drink coffee till my hand would shake otherwise uh when I finally pulled into uh, Portland, Oregon, I was hallucinating for 50 miles. I, dolphins came in and out of my windshield. Buildings were there that weren't there. And all I thought, I remembered my mentor said, the difference between someone who's insane and insane is the insane person can drive their car. So I thought, well, I'm going to do it. So I drove for 50 miles like that. And all I remembered is, the red lights in the back of those cars, the tail lights, they are real. Pay attention to that. Enjoy the rest of the show, but watch those. And, and, and at first, I didn't realize that I was coming on. About 50 miles from Portland, maybe 75 miles, I looked at this farm and said, oh, my God, what a beautiful place. 
I've never seen anything like that. Why is that so beautiful? I've got to write down the mile marker to, to remember that. Then I noticed everything was looking beautiful. And then I realized I was high as a kite, with no drugs whatsoever, and that my sleep deprivation had cut in. And uh, when I finally fell asleep, I went over the bridge into Washington, found a rest stop, and I thought, well, how am I going to sleep in this truck with a bucket seat and with stuff packed up uh, beside me? And that's the last thing I remember. I woke up with the sunshine in my face about six hours later. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was my drive up here. I, I almost crashed, I think probably three times because I almost fell asleep. But I did those cold brew coffees and didn't, it was the caffeine was just going right through me or something. But that's it gets, I, before I started drinking coffee, that's what I, I'd only use it for long term travel. Uh, uh, but I didn't drink any coffee until my mentor again at Donald Lake said, It's good for you. Okay. <laughs> and so I'm work, I'm managing the health food store and they're wondering, Why are you drinking coffee? Because at that point, it was a cardinal sin to drink coffee in the health food business in the 1980s. Then it started getting better and better. People started talking about it as an ergogenic for athletics. And definitely, oh, it, it uh, increased my, uh, my bench press uh, quite a bit when I started doing coffee. Yeah, I feel just an increase in health overall with it. And um, I even recently... I know some people are super against it, but started microdosing T3 just to see how I feel from it. Just like a fourth of a grain a day. Um, but Ray Pete said some wild stuff, like people gain weight really easily on it if they can't, you know, beforehand. And of course, with the nutritional foundation. Yeah, he has a lot of a lot of good things about that. And I think he's on to something because uh, my pulse rate was always at 60. And then when I went into his diet and gave up uh, tuna and things, it went to 72. And all my life, it's been 60. So he's not against it being 60, but you've got to get there naturally. He knows that if you do a certain amount of things, but most people are there unnaturally. And I thought I was extra healthy by being 60, and now I'm up to 72. And again, all my life, my decades, I went at 60, and I thought, oh, that's really, really good for me. And it turned out in my case, I was a kind of a counterfeit healthy person. That's funny. <laughs> um, so I have kind of jumping topics. Um, I've been messing around because I I um, met a doctor and I've been following his, his work for a little while and on hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And like earlier, you were talking about oxygen and CO2 and how, if I'm understanding it correct, you would want oxygen more at the start of the day and CO2 at the end. Would you give any tips to someone like using hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Because it seems like for for wound healing and for a lot of things, infections, it could be highly beneficial um, in context. But I, uh, one of my best friends, the Leather Tiger was his marine name, George Wellington Adams. And he was a pioneer in uh, bringing the uh, hyperbaric chambers back to the US. Before the Second World War, they actually had a six story, totally pressurized hospital in St. Louis totally pressurized. For the war, they broke it down for spare parts. It was backed by a famous uh, millionaire, I choose to remember whatever his name was. Uh, many people went to it for treatment. Each room was pressurized. I guess just the hallway in between wasn't pressurized. Uh, the danger of it, it can get rid of gangrene and a whole bunch of diseases. Uh, the problem with it is they need to add some carbon dioxide to it. And all they have to do is go and find a company called Carvagen. Carvagen makes it in two and a half, five uh, percent solution and seven percent pollution. They used to use it in seven percent pollution to see if a person could take psychedelic drugs. If they if they felt like they were being suffocated, then they said you can't take suffocate you can't take psychedelic drugs. It was a common test. They don't do it much more. But the minds knew that you needed a certain amount of carbon dioxide in the air, they preferred the 3% mix. And I, in my research, uh, I'm not sure if Ray Pete thinks it's five or what it is. He knows that you sweat unduly with 7%. So I think he would probably agree 3 to 5% is a good percentage. And it's healthier for you. So if global warming really did exist, he has no problem with it. We need more carbon dioxide. Uh, and the small amount that's happening is, is really minuscule at this point. Uh, but anyway, uh, 
brain damage occurs with pure oxygen and under pressure even more so. These articles you can find in Scientific American. Uh, they ran about two or three articles on brain damage from pure oxygen. But all you have to do, someone just has to add a little carbon into the formula and you have things that heal diabetic gangrene, uh, a host of conditions, not to mention nitrogen narcosis, was what, uh, what divers use it for. Uh, they put them in sometimes for a day. In these hospitals, they would hospitalize them for three days. And here's an amazing thing about hyperbaric chambers. Say you're losing blood and you don't want a transfusion. Go under two pressure. That's just double the pressure, 33 feet under the water or in a pressurized room at 33. You don't need a single red blood cell to give you oxygen. It's all done like in the cornea of the eye. There's no, if you had blood vessels in the cornea of your eyes, you couldn't see anything. <laughs> so it's done the same way. You actually force by pressure all the oxygen to every place it needs to go in the oxygen at two to maybe a tiny bit more if you don't want to be really, really sleepy because at two, you'd be really sleepy. Well, they could do that. Maybe put a blood builder if they wanted to speed up the process or just leave you there until the blood rebuilt because those cells will be rebuilt uh, uh, by the by the liver to make those new blood cells. And, and the spleen will help. The spleen normally destroys red blood cells and saves the iron, saves too much of it in most people. But in the case of really low iron, the spleen will turn on and revert back to uh, like you were a fetal uh, entity uh, coming in, it actually uh, increases and, and grows uh, hemoglobin cells. So you could do it naturally, say a week in one of those chambers at 2%, you could be fine. We're like living on another planet with a, a higher uh, pressurization from the gravity and uh, be healthy. But they want to do the blood transfusion and the Jehovah's Witnesses, when they started doing their blood uh, transfers without oxygen, they had a much higher survival rate, and a lot of doctors refused to do blood transfusion because of that. They'll do other methods. You can get serum. You can make serum out of seaweed and a whole bunch of other things. They're natural. They've been around since the 50s, maybe the 40s, and uh, the medical profession wants you in to give blood so that they can... Uh, classify you and make sure you're coming back to them. You know, if I wanted to wow. lose blood, I'd slip, <laughs> I'd slip my wrist a little bit and bleed out and uh, maybe have a blood sandwich or, you know, <laughs> or, or put it on the soil. They help the soil grow. Bleaches. Yeah. <laughs> That's interesting. Carbogen. I'm going to look into that. I wonder if the dose makes the poison too, because I know like Justin Bieber sleeps in one. I don't know if I'd want to sleep in a chamber, especially if it was a hundred percent, but I'm just doing like 1.3 atmosphere. It's called like really mild, like super mild hyperbaric therapy, only an hour, even 45 minutes to an hour or so. I wonder if the dose not being keto helps too, because I'm making more carbon dioxide internally. <laughs> Could be. It's really popular now, hypobaric chambers, where people are like living up in the mountains and it makes more carbon dioxide. So they have a choice of either putting more carbon dioxide on or having less pressure so the oxygen moves out and so uh and it's and it seems to be healthy too i think eventually they would go into acid alkalinity and figure this out i haven't done extensive research on that just peripheral but uh, it would make a big difference and medical research should go into what's the difference between hypobaric what does that solve and what does hyperbaric uh, do the pressurization is important for weight gain and loss. It's important for so many things. And it's uh, the physics, chemistry is, uh, has become their, uh, their main love of the mainstream medicine. Physics is what really works. Uh, the geometry of a fruit is more important often than the, uh, than the physics of a, a fruit. Think if I eat something and if I go with the chemistry, well, my digestion is going to be determined on the temperature of my stomach, on my psychic, uh, what I'm thinking about, uh, my stress level, my hormone level, many, many, the climate, the humidity, all of these things are going to affect how that mineral gets used or that nutrient gets used, the vitamin or whatever. And uh, mainstream medicine ignores those because they want something simplistic. 
because they think the mob can't think above that. In many cases, they can't because they're brainwashed. But once we free people of that and think three-dimensionally, you know that drawing where you uh, draw the line outside of the box to make four lines in one? That's the kind of thinking we need. And most people are confined where they can't think outside of the box, so to speak. I think that's where the expression even comes from, from that little drawing. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> um, it's getting dark there, huh? <laughs> it is. Yeah, it starts around three, three o'clock. The sun starts, because I'm in a valley too, so it's... <laughs> cool. Is that a red light? It is, yeah. Yeah, neat. Like that's how our, we have a red light like that too. Uh, cool. Cool. Oh, cool. yeah. I have this blue light too that I started using, which is really bright. <laughs> yeah, midday, the blue light is very good at about high noon, particularly because mm -hmm. it's the controller of our circadian rhythm. When you have it at nighttime, it can uh, can mess with it. And sometimes, one out of 10 people, unfortunately, the red light will change their circadian rhythm too. But if it's brighter than like a Christmas tree light or maybe a 40 watt bulb or something like that, I take those chances. I, I go to sleep with the red light on usually <laughs> and only turn it off toward dawn. That's awesome. Especially so, now with the heater, you know, they forget when they go into energy quotients, they forget how much heat those things put off. And you can you hang around those red lights. You almost don't need to be by a fireplace or anything. I'll sometimes utilize that. Yeah, I have like the, the big red lights. Yeah. I'm warm my hands a lot of times if they're cold. By the way, Ray Pete has a very interesting way to retain magnesium. Wear a hat. Really? It does it extend your life. And there's a uh, a man named uh what was his name? Darius Dinja. He wears one of those uh, Zoroastrian type hats. And uh, he was asked on an interview uh, show one time why he wears it. He says, extend my longevity. Keeping your wow. head warm. And Ray Pete's really big on keeping your feet warm and your head warm. And there really is something to that. I, I definitely feel the difference. Yeah, maybe it's because I'm here up here in Idaho, but wearing a beanie and gloves when I'm outside helps i could even be in a shirt but as long as i'm wearing a beanie and a and gloves i'm fine <laughs> now i find a trick of yin and yang that i used to do uh and i went through a phase of being very resistant to cold but my secret was take a cold shower uh but not long don't get a chill out of it you just superficially get that cold you don't get bone cold and then I could go out in the snow in a bathing suit. I used to go do that to freak people out. I'd be lying down on a bench in the snow in, in, a, in, a, in a Speedo, and people would walk by, and they would pretend they didn't see me going to a workshop. I could do that in Flagstaff once. And the secret was uh, uh, take a cold shower very briefly and then punch with your arms and, and move your legs in a kick to the side and a kick to the side. Chiropractors tell you not to do it, but I've done it thousands of times to warm yourself up. You're, uh, you have muscles in there related to the triple heater meridian and acupuncture, and they warm you up really quickly when you kick to the side. Squats work too, but not as well as the side kicks. And you adjust your spine at the same time. So, <laughs> the chiropractors freak out if they say you're doing, oh, you're gonna put your back out. Well, <laughs> I've done it millions of times, probably. And without exaggerating, probably millions of times. <laughs> Someone asked your thoughts on chiropractic care. Is it necessary because people are lazy nowadays? Someone asked. <laughs> Auto practice. You can fix anything by free form dancing, where you do every kind of movement and make each one different in, in, in some way. Uh, I had a Sufi teacher that said, uh, pretend you're going out into the water and the waves are coming in and your body's moving by the waves, or pretend you're a kite floating in the and the breeze is moving you. So uh, uh, you can cure yourself from a lot of things by doing that, as I've done, for 12 hours straight or more sometimes, just freeform dancing. Yeah, and it's therapeutic. Auto practice is what it's called. But chiropractic can be valuable if you, uh, I think they should teach it in, uh, in school to people because a lot of it, if you, as long as you do it gently, you're not going to hurt someone. Older people, uh, they have to watch it sometimes they get delicate and you have to be very careful chiropractors overdo their adjustments 
And particularly with the neck and places like that, you can paralyze the person for life or even kill them. But uh, mostly if you do it really gently and kind of let it go into place, uh, I've adjusted people by sitting on their back while they're lying down. <laughs> it all goes just like that. And many people, certain meridians in their body make their back. You ever seen a person with a really rounded back? Early, if you get that person when they're younger, you can sit on their back and the whole thing goes <laughs> like that. And, uh, and uh, later, though, it starts to solidify where you get a uh, calcification, over-calcification of the spine, and it locks up where you can't do it. I studied with a guy who studied with a chiropractor who wasn't a chiropractor. And back in the uh, 90s, he freed every vertebra in my body and said it was one he couldn't get. But just before I left Bellingham, Washington, he got that vertebra. Otherwise, he said you could do one of those uh, castor oil packs, which are really good to actually move those frozen vet, uh, vertebra. So uh, vertebra are very important and you can keep them flexible. And if you don't want to go to a chiropractor, do lots of free form uh, ex dancing, go back and touch the floor backwards and go forward. Don Peters, the bodybuilder I told you about, as muscular as he was, he could put his nose between his uh, calves and then he could go back all the way to the back and touch his back on the floor and then come back up another guy if you've ever seen a bodybuilder called charles glass uh he was able to do a flip on stage even with all that muscle now that's usable muscle you get people like franco colombo and you see him in the schwarzenegger movie when he's jumping over the fence it looks really funny like he's really clumsy uh, no diss against colombo who was also a chiropractor uh, he was a good guy, but you could tell his muscle wasn't that usable. But you can have a, a lot of muscle and have it very usable. Don Peters could do that. And then he could take uh, one of these big spiked nails and he put a leather thing on his hand and he could just bend it. So he was into strength too. He was very much into both strength and bodybuilding. Without wow. steroids, no steroids. At that um, time. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, my friend Joe asked, how to approach healing and ailment from a spiritual cause? It's kind of a vague question, but I don't know if you... <laughs> oh, how to, what? how to heal an ailment that has a spiritual cause. I guess you have to do reflexology, right? And figure out. Or... <laughs> you know, I have something called mind hacking that I came up by total accident by turning people's feet. If you do a figure eight sideways, like the infinity sign with both feet, you will notice if a person has any kind of trauma, it registers. They automatically will jump. And as strange as this is going to sound, the male trauma happens on the left and the female trauma on the right. And it sounds crazy, but if anybody tries it, they'll see for themselves. In fact, I have a, uh, uh, I have a good friend that said, how come you're the only guy that says the male is on the left and the female on the right, everybody else says the other. I said, can we do an experiment? And she says, sure. I said, get down and hold. I said to her husband, can you get down on the floor? He said, sure. So I said, hold his feet. Just hold them now and kind of move them slightly. Okay. And I said, uh, tell me, uh, is your mother coming to town? His right foot is moving. Because <laughs> I knew he had a mother trauma, a serious mother trauma. His right foot is, and then I sarcastically said, is his mother a man or a woman? Because it was appearing on the right side. And uh, this can be misleading because many women who are raped by the father, uh, it shows up in the mother because the mother didn't protect them. I found that out through, through mind hacking before I realized when I told it to some of my psychologist friends, they said, that's been well done for a long time. In fact, nine out of 10 women the primary trauma will be done with the mother, not with the father. I found other things that, like that. I found them out from experience. That's how I knew it worked because as I told the person that, I, that did that with uh, their husband, I said, uh, don't read about it in a book. You know, I said, look, at that point, I wore glasses. I don't need them anymore, by the way. But at that point, I needed glasses. So I said, look at these glasses. You read in a book, 50% of the books say, if you let them go, they drop to the floor. 50% say they rise to the sky. Don't read it in a book. Drop the glasses and look where they go. 
but always keep in mind that there could be an exception to the rule. If I do that up on the space station, they may go the other way. <laughs> There's always a white crow that might show up among the uh, the black crows that every we only have black crows. And suddenly, whoa! There's a white crow in Australia. Yes, no, maybe, right? <laughs> yes, no, maybe, exactly. <laughs> you, you always predict the questions because someone asks, uh, "What are Adam's? <laughs> what are Adam's eyesight improvement tips and thoughts on wearing glasses?" You know, the Bates method is a really good way. If you've heard about that, uh, what you simply do is uh, is move the eyes in a circular motion. A lot of exercises I've learned from yoga are doing that too, that they match. And uh, the other thing is to memorize the chart. This is very strange. Memorize the Snelling eye chart and then look at it through your memory. And it will actually print where it's better. That's actually one of the Bates techniques I, I was amazed at. And uh, like I look at you close up, then I look in the distance, then I look at you, then I look close up, then I look at my hand, then I look at the distance. That gives the eye exercise. And contrary to popular belief, read in the dark, read in a bumpy car, uh, do all those things, and uh, it actually strengthens the eye. Mine went away from a combination of eating pistachios in the morning, small amounts, even with the uh, they have more omega-6s than omega-3s in it. And you notice how they look like eyes, and they have visual purple in them along with the green. Uh, so I ate pistachios, and then I would have sunflower seeds, but I kind of gave those up. I, I really didn't like sunflower seeds. But I did have carrots at night, despite the beta carotene and all. And I told a guy this one time that said, I'm getting a change of job, and I flunked the eye test but they're going to give me a second chance. Have you got anything that can help my eyes? I gave him that entire protocol. And in one week, he passed the test. I never saw him again because he transferred to another part of the country. So uh, there are numerous ways to improve it. And I don't know what happened. I wore glasses for 20, let's see, 87 to 2009. And one day I looked at the newspaper and started reading it. And I thought, I'm not wearing my glasses. And before that, I couldn't, if I looked at a book, it was blurry. I couldn't go in. If I forgot my glasses in a bookstore, forget it. I would be really upset. I had to go buy a pair of glasses so I could read a book. Now, uh, I still use them for fine print, but I can read level, uh, labels. And I can go to a bookstore and read any book, small print, labels, things like that. And now that's been 2009. It's been 11 years. My eyes are still okay. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, I've been kind of delving into the eyes. Like I interviewed my friend Victor because he's um, partially blind or has night blindness. And um, it seems like PUFAs plus blue light or even blue and UV light plus omega-3s in the eye, that really causes a lot of damage. And I think most people are unaware of that, right, uh, that are wearing yeah. glasses. Contacts. Or... Blue light definitely does. In fact, surfers here get uh, what do they call it? it it's uh, it's a, a Latin word for butterfly. You get butterfly eyes. I have a good friend that's a windsurfer, uh, Olympic uh, windsurfer, and he had a little problem with that at one time because he's in the sun all the time. You know, um, you can get too much sun, uh, despite what Jack Cruz says. <laughs> they can't get it. Uh, and of course, we've seen that he has some uh, lipofuscin problem there going on. <laughs> <laughs> hate to pick yeah. on jack but there it is <laughs> yeah I, I mean i wish we can get unlimited i used to believe that and i tried it and i'm glad i didn't do it for like a decade or more because i definitely would have gotten a lot of lipofuscin <laughs> it was just like a year or two experiment where it was like cold plunging unlimited sun plus poofas and yeah. uh you know one of the wild. one of the best times to get red light is at sunrise and sunset we have compensation vision where we see it as multicolored, but actually the light is red at that point. So that if you notice during sunrise and sunlight, the shadows are green, the complementary color of, of red. So you can get plenty of red light in the first hour from the time it comes over the tip of the a flat horizon. Mountains kind of change it a little bit. Uh, like if you're in the ocean, that's a perfect place because you're at 180 degrees. 
the first hour you get red light and the first hour last hour you get red light and it's a really powerful red light at that point and uh, that's your best therapy at all so a lot of times i get up to time my body by just looking at the sunlight as it comes over the hill and sometimes i attempt to see it at night that's why something peculiar at nighttime the green flash if you're from san diego it was a uh, in that area it was really common people used to go to the park in la jolla to take photographs of the green flash and particularly in january the weather would be really nice down there and there'd be a whole crowd and they'd applaud when the green flash they'd be taking camera photographs i wouldn't be looking for it because it would happen uh, probably one out of three days down there here i've only seen it in santa barbara three times three times in uh uh, all in a couple of years when we had access to a really good view of the sun going down over the sea. Wow. Yeah, years ago, I when I was a cannabis delivery driver, I'd get off work, and then I was down by Chula Vista, so I'd drive to the beach and get my bare feet in the wet sand at sunset and just cool. you know stare directly into the sun. And I definitely felt like a whole body effect. Uh, it was like my brain, something in my heart, like a vibrating or something. And I guess it was just the colors and the frequencies that was getting into my nervous system. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of things in sunlight that they haven't measured. Uh, General Electric did extensive research on that. And now we just limit it to vitamin D in certain frequencies that they, they pull a certain frequency out of the air. A lot of people don't realize you get plenty of vitamin D by putting your food out in the sun. Mushrooms are particularly quick. You can probably leave them in the, out there for five minutes and get substantial amounts. Other foods may take 30 minutes. This includes pasta. It, it includes just about every food. If you do a vegetable source, you're going to get D2. And if you do an animal source, you're going to get uh, B, uh, D3. Good source for D2 is olive oil good, and uh, mushrooms. Good source for D3. Uh, put some butter out there. Put some meat out there. Put some egg out there. And then you'll get D3. That's awesome. <laughs> That's how they first discovered it. But they called it an anti-Rickett effect. And it was more Rickett's effect. And it was more likely then because they didn't try to classify it as a vitamin. Because we actually get what I call full spectrum vitamin D. Each one is different for each frequency. And that's why the sun is so much healthier. Many people who take, uh, uh, I, have, I know someone takes 50,000 international units of D. And they're below level. They check the blood. Oh, you're below level. Now they used to say on Wikipedia, uh, you could take uh, you could take fifty thousand, but you could only take it for two or three months. Now people are recommending you take huge amounts. Even Ray Pete, I'm surprised he's so uh, liberal about taking vitamin D, uh, but he does admit the best place to get it is sunlight. Yeah, there's a deep relationship with calcium, right? And I know there's a lot of misinformation disinformation just confusion about calcium in general but it's my understanding that vitamin d supplementation targets calcium and increases like calcium absorption which is not necessarily a good thing if people are drinking tap water well water spring water with a ton of calcium in it and supplementing d <laughs> yeah. there you know there's some counter evidence to that now but i think they do have a connection because they they proved it with for sure with sunlight, it makes a difference. Because in, in children that didn't get exposed to sunlight and didn't get the proper food, they got rickets. But all you had to do is put them out in the sun and they got rid of rickets. So obviously that's bone development. So I don't see how the new studies can say that there is no connection between that. Now there's other ways to get it. Uh, yogis who just lived on donkey's milk the one was buried for 40 days. I've told you about this guy. He didn't go out in the sun because the sun would mess up his ability to do that. I have no idea how that works. And I wouldn't try it. I prefer to go out in the sun myself because it's nicer out there. <laughs> than being underground. <laughs> yeah. Then, uh, you know, staying 40, I think I would get bored. <laughs> but I guess yogis don't get bored. But I'm still human, so I get bored. <laughs> well, that's a good segue to this question. Uh, someone asks, what do you do to kick back and relax during these insane times? <laughs> you know, uh, I really need to learn to do that because lately uh, uh, I've just seen some research where you get your best thing if you 
uh, let's see, what's the name? The, a scientist who did something really, I forget what he, oh, the first, uh, the first real computer. Yeah. What was his name? He lived into his 90s. But he said how he got his development, he would do something totally different than what he was concentrating on. And his favorite thing was to drive. So one time he, uh, he got really discouraged trying to make an electronic computer out of a mechanical computer. He was hired by IBM or one of those big companies. And so he got discouraged. He just got in his car and he drove and he drove and he drove. He ended up in another, crossing the river into another state, 190 miles away. He drove so much and he thought, wow. He said, well, I might as well go get a beer. And this is a dry county, so I'll drive over the bridge to this county. And so he had his beer. And while he was having the beer, the whole image complete of the electronic computer came into his mind. So he drove quickly back. And now we have an electronic computer, thanks to this guy. He, did, he gives lectures on YouTube. Well, he's not with us anymore. He left at, uh, I think he lived to 93 or so. But I, so I've been experimenting with, I uh, go do the dishes, go uh, rake up the pine needles outside in the backyard, do things like that. And then my creativity starts taking off. I'll, I'll wake up from sleep and write a blog immediately because it comes into a full glance, a, a full blast. But I've been accused of not knowing how to relax. My friend said, I never see you. Like we hung out together for a week. Uh, the same guy that's in, uh, in uh, Idaho at a place in Corpus Christi at the beach. And so we're hanging out, kind of batching it for a week. And he said, you know, I never see you with any downtime. You're always reading something, doing something or whatever. And uh, guilty. I think there's a case for kicking back. And I used to do that by meditate. I used to meditate as much as two and a half hours or three hours at one time. Uh, but lately I haven't been and uh, been busy writing books, blogs, newsletters, and et cetera. That's awesome. I think that's a good thing um, to keep the brain active. I, I've i been doing like a Byronal Beats. I forget if I've asked you about it in the past, but um, this one I've been using New Calm, but... I'll do like often 40, 50 minutes um, in my little chamber with it, just with headphones and an eye mask. And I feel like I took, like I slept, like I took a nap when I get cool. out of that. It's pretty cool. <laughs> well, the one thing they, they proved from transcendental meditation back in the area and the people who like Benson split off from TM, but they proved that you could drop lactic acid and that's a villain for Ray Pete, Warburg and people like that. You could drop it more in 20 minutes of meditation than you could in an entire night's sleep. And so I was confused when I got into the health food business. Why are they big on lactic acid? It was the devil when I was in transcendental meditation. You, you couldn't get lactic acid. And indeed, all the research was pointing lactic acid was for stress. Uh, and so... Uh, so anyway, I found that meditation could regenerate me. And the state of Arizona actually picked up on a kind of meditation. They knew that if you just take a nap for 20 minutes, you won't get that feeling of like you've been mugged after you wake up from a nap. So they would have roadside stops with a comfortable chair and headphones for music. And it would have an alarm clock at 20 minutes because they proved that you have more traffic accidents if you do 25 minutes than 20 minutes. Now, my motto back in the day that they taught me was TM, 20 minutes in the AM, 20 minutes in the PM, and no more. They said you get into this gradual, and then you work up after years of meditating like that. I found it helped me a lot, and I found uh, my synchronicities increased dramatically when I was doing that. And I hung out with someone who was the my model of synchronicity. She was a regular meditator, and I just saw things happen around her that were absolutely phenomenal. That's amazing. So, yeah, uh, yeah. It, it, some kind of meditation or or uh, dishwashing, things that picture my creativity, playing an instrument, doodling, drawing, drawing. Those things I think really help brain development actually and balance the hemispheres of our brains. You don't need hemisync and all that fancy stuff. 
We just need to, to do some kind of a right brain work, creative, creative work, and then left brain work. And if you combine them, it makes for a stronger brain. Otherwise, they get quite imbalanced. Hmm. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, let's see. Um, how? Why would someone not be able to tolerate magnesium? They get headaches and severe depression. You wrote a whole book, ebook on magnesium, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, wrong type of magnesium. Because if if they couldn't really tolerate magnesium, they'd be dead. Because <laughs> magnesium is a very important element. You've had Morley Roberts on and other people, Ray Pete, uh, they'll tell you the same thing. Uh, but usually a lot of the things that uh, people take just switch to a different one. And I prefer, like Ray Pete does, to get it out of the diet. A vegetarian can get his by taking green vegetables and boiling the heck out of them and drinking the juice. I don't even need the vegetables. But uh, you'll find magnesium in meat. You'll find it in multiple places. Uh, in fact, Wikipedia is a fairly good, uh, yeah, there you go. Coffee, <laughs> coffee is another source. That's right, that's right. Uh, I would go to Ray Pete, I mean, I would go to Wikipedia because they have these limits. One thing though, when you see those uh, ingredients in food, that's an average. People don't realize that you can take an herb that says it's high in, a, in something, and that's why you take it. But if it grows at a different altitude, uh, a 1,000 or 2,000 feet different or near the sea, it has none of that in, none at all. The only really essential ingredients for life are hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon. Now, the rest of them, it really depends. Plants don't need selenium at all. We do. Uh, so you have to be really careful on following those guidelines. However, they give you a ballpark idea of where to get them. And magnesium is fairly common to get unless you eat a junk food diet or you don't take enough salt or you don't wear a hat or uh, what is other things? Uh, salt, oh, thyroid. Without, without the proper thyroid function, you won't absorb magnesium. And you can get what's called grass tetany. Uh, cows suffer from it all the time. And magnesium, uh, it's very important. That's why they protect against grass tetany and make sure that they're getting the proper food that has magnesium. Because a lot of, despite the fact that there is chlorophyll at the center of magnesium, it often doesn't digest for some of these cattle. That's why you can, you unless you have the broth of these green vegetables, the walls won't break down and the, and the, uh, the uh, the chlorophyll uh, stays whole, and you never get the magnesium out of it. But if you break it down, then the magnesium is readily available for absorption. And potatoes have magnesium, right? I had three for dinner last night. They have some in too. It's a it's a great thing. I just heard uh, someone talking about a movie called The Martian, and, it, and where Matt Damon gets stranded on Mars and has to survive. He survives on potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. And I saw it in the theater. That was a good movie, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it was good. I I haven't seen it. I just read that. I just heard that today on a on a talk show. Giving us truth with lies, right? Showing us. <laughs> right. <the potato>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like I'd like to see the movie. It sounds really, it's really good. and a positive sci-fi movie because you know most of them are very dystopian. Like you meet some kind of alien or some uh, uh, amoeba or virus from outer space that kills you or something's going on. Yeah, I really enjoyed like uh, Prometheus and then like Alien Covenant was the second one, which is more action. Uh, you okay. know, the Prometheus was more a little relaxed, but it was kind of a spinoff from that old movie, The Alien, you know, where they plant an egg in the person and it sprouts. Oh, yeah. Stuff. I saw, I saw the Alien 2 in the front row of the theater. It was so crowded. That's really a thrill to see Alien 2 in the front row of the movie theater in Westwood, California. Little baby alien popping up in your face. Yeah. <laughs> but the space crash was like, holy cow, it's been on lap. It's almost like 3D. <laughs> um, this is a, a funny one. What are the benefits of semen retention? <laughs> um, you know, there really aren't many unless now there is a person called a ma who i really do trust for a lot of things the hugging thing her cheek is black and blue from hugging millions and millions of people she can't go hug people now because of covid though she's stranded in india but uh she said under certain 
conditions with a trained teacher, it's beneficial. There's a Taoist master named uh, Wu Dang Chen, who I studied with, who says it has value for certain limited periods of time. But mostly, I'm a Reiki. Charge and discharge. And that a full organ orgasm only happens with the charge and the discharge. And you need both for proper health. That's the subject of my latest uh, issue of uh, Sex Newsletter. I go, I, I go into it somewhat in the first issue, but I really found a lot of information. Because somewhere on the Internet, you can't believe all you read on the Internet, it said that Reich had for orgasm but no ejaculation. And I thought, that doesn't sound right to me, but I better double-check that. Well, I have a lot of books by Alexander Bowen, the student of him, and it, it's refuted easily. He was definitely for charge and discharge. And then I found research from sexologists a hundred over a hundred years ago, 120, 30 years ago, that knew about that. And basically the sexologists at the time know more about sexology than the mainstream doctors today. They knew more about it. And uh, I discovered a lot of those sexologists at a medical library, volumes and volumes of books on it discounting the whole idea of seminal fluid. In India, they call it dot syndrome. It's a syndrome where people think that, the, that they're, they're losing seminal fluid and that it's taking their life force away, and they treat it as a psychosomatic order, uh, a disorder connected with uh, depression and a whole bunch of other things, and withholding syndrome, where I'm not going to give my lady the enjoyment of that. Because a lot of women actually get enjoyment if the guy doesn't uh, have an orgasm, they feel something's wrong. <laughs> yeah. Does that Maybe go that's against they want a child? Though. You know, it could be. But I've I've seen women that uh, don't want children that they uh, feel deprived. Does that go against like the Montauk Chia thing? Because he's all about retention, right? So. I was told by somebody, an authority, that Montauk Chopra doesn't know. Uh, his penis from a, well, anyway, <laughs> let's drop it there. Uh, uh, he has a few little truths mixed with fantasy. And the Taoists all aren't seminal retentionists. That's a fiction. Now, a lot of them wanted it. And, and look at, the, if you look at the Indian uh, Kama Sutra, oh no, there was no seminal retention there. Indeed not. The only seminal retention is when people had harems and they needed to last for a hundred women. Then, unless you're a, a porn star or something like that, like the guy I told you that actually could eat tuna to do that. You ate the big, what are those big cans of tuna that are, uh, uh, you get at Costco? He would eat uh, several of those at a session. So it can increase your sexuality, but at a price. So I don't recommend people eating tuna to do that unless they have a really heavy date once in their life. And otherwise, stay away from tuna. And, and I'm living proof. It gave me a lot of problems uh, that I've gotten rid of since. I, I was starting to have all the symptoms of uh, premature aging. And of course, I'm, I was in my 70s by then, but still, uh, these symptoms were very annoying. The edema was the, the most uh, annoying of all. And then some muscle stiffness that went away completely. I believe oranges are one of the best things you can eat for your thyroid and for magnesium. It helps the ability of magnesium to absorb. So uh, I, I wouldn't recommend uh, tuna except for a heavy day. So would sugar be better than tuna for that purpose? <laughs> yes, I think so. I think sugar, we powered on sugar. Now, what is the sperm powered on? Fructose. And of course, oh, that's the devil, uh, fructose. and. Uh, the liver, its primary sugar is fructose. It will make fructose out of sucrose or whatever it is to get it, and they want to say it's bad. Now, if you if you get fructose made from corn, like it's sold at the health food store, then you'll have a corn allergy or corn problems. And much of that fructose is impure anyway. But when you get it uh, as sucrose, plain table sugar, half glucose, half fructose, you get a lot of fructose right there. And so uh, if you have a fruit that has fructose, then it doesn't bother me. 
and it always was healthy and suddenly fructose bad. Yeah. <laughs> you ever notice in medicine, the words that are the shortest are the worst for you. Salt, only four word, letters, it must be bad. Fat, three letters, even worse. Sugar, almost as bad, five letters. But all these big, long chemicals, uh, resveratrol and stuff, they're okay. Especially the ones that are even longer than that. You know, there's a lot of things like, uh, golly, I even forgot how to say DHA, doxa, hexa, noic acid or something. That's got to totally be good because it's a really long word. <laughs> it's so true. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> yeah. it's. I mean, speaking of long words, listen to this. Um, someone's wondering how to reverse muscular dystrophy, limb girdle, type 2B myosin myopathy. <laughs> you know, it's there very... are so many of the, they overdo these categorizations. And remember, a diagnosis uh, I'm writing a blog about this right now. Uh, a diagnosis, what does symptom mean? It actually means, if you look it up, it means uh, uh, something akin to guess. That's what it means. It actually means, uh, uh, what is the technical word they use? But basically, it's a guess. So if a symptom is a guess, uh, then a disease is a combination of symptoms. It's a combination of guesses. So... They often diagnose things that aren't even diseases so they can make money treating it. So first of all, common sense, find out who's the matter with me. And that's where mind hacking comes in. And then treat it as what are your symptoms? Don't go and say, well, this symptom was caused by this. If you eat something and you feel better, you're probably on the right track. And uh, automatically, you can get most everything you want out of food. Or in a case, some cases, a few supplements, and only drugs in rare cases, like certain thyroid medications, can be good. Antibiotics for certain things can be beneficial. So there, I'm not totally anti-drug, but I am anti-99% of them, which are just there to make money, not for anything else. But there are some drugs that are good. Even Oliver Wendell Holmes was it uh, the the judge who said. We'd be better off if we threw the entire Materia Medica into the ocean, but the fish would be the worse off for it. But he <laughs> believed in opium, which I think opioids are valuable medications for certain pain. Uh, if you know what you're doing and don't use the synthetic opioids, you use the opiates, the uh, morphine, instead of uh, God, these drugs 200 times more powerful now. Uh, and heroin was to cure morphine. Look what happened with that. Uh, and then antibiotics, I think he was, no, no, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, anesthesia the type of drugs for doing surgeries. He didn't uh, take those out. Ford got attacked by the pharmaceutical company, Henry Ford, for wanting to have a drugless hospital. Oh, no, you can't have that because even the pharma pharmaceutical company was a lot weaker then, but it was already getting together. And now... We have a medical police state. We can't, uh, we, you can't take responsibility for your own health anymore. You say you got to go to them, not just vaccinations. You got to go for them for this, for that, for everything. You got to get a test every year. You got to get something up your butt to make sure you don't have a follow up. You got to do this. You got to do that. And those tests are there to connect you so you will come back. Even Illich wrote a book about that in 73. It's eerily prophetic. Because it goes into exactly what's happening today if you read that book. And it's free on the internet. I recommend anybody who wants to know what's going on today, read his 1973 book, Medical Nemesis. Medical Nemesis. Awesome. Yeah, I've, I noticed that little hamster wheel that they, the medical mafia gets people in. And, and then you get the pacemaker. And then you get certain things put in to where your treatment options go narrow down to really nothing because you can't you know be around magnetic things or whatever it's like it's really uh diabolical um the whole process of that but um you're you're too psychic because you actually predicted <laughs> there's a question here <laughs> what do you think about kratom uh is it beneficial for some reason kratom is like trending and i think that's an opiate or an opioid i forget the difference that you just mentioned but Kratom is really popular right now, I guess, in the alternative health. 
space. What's it called? Oh, kratom or kratom. Um, if you, it's a it's a it's a natural opioid. Mm. It's like an herb. Um, but I've heard of people kind of getting addicted to it. Um, yeah, it's in the coffee family. Um, opioid mm. properties and stimulant like effects. Um, they sell it in like little pills and stuff. Like I've been at like health food conferences and they provide oh. it, but. <laughs> you know, yeah. I have to check that out. That's one that's over on me. I haven't heard about that, but the original morphine can be beneficial. It can be abused. It was abused. You know, the Chinese didn't want it. They used it, but they used it creatively until the, uh, uh, what is it? The, uh, the British basically went in there and started the opium wars to force them to grow opium instead of food. And they grew it. Uh, they had two opium wars. And they flooded this uh, America with opium. A lot of people don't know where did Harvard get its money from opium trading? Where did the Franklin Delano Roosevelt get its money from opium trading? Harvard uses this, the Jolly Roger. They were pirates originally. The money came from pirating and from from uh, from morphine. <laughs> so anyway, morphine was uh, was used very abusively. But for therapy, there have been surgeons who have used therapy every day of their lives for like years, and uh, but they took the correct dose. When you're on the street, you don't know if you're going to get a thimbleful or a roomful of it in your pill, and uh, that's why so many people die from it. If you know what you're doing, I don't recommend people do it because uh, part of healing is the pain. People don't realize that. When you learn to endure pain by natural methods, you actually prevent the disease. When you turn off the pain signal, the body says, oh, I guess it's okay with this guy. Give him, give him the disease. So I learned from my mentor, don't discount pain because pain is part of your therapy. Now, if it gets too bad, you learn techniques to do it. Acupuncture can do it. Reflexology can do it. There's mental tricks to do it. Like if a person is ticklish, how do they break it? They act aggressively and pretend they're tickling the person tickling them. Because you ever try to tickle yourself? Can't do it. <laughs> can't do it. Someone else, because your brainwave frequencies are different than them, you can't keep track of it. But if you calibrate your stomach where they're tickling you or your feet to them, I've taught people this technique and it works. Uh, uh, as long as you concentrate. Once you lose your concentration, then they got you because then you tend to go downward. Well, the same with uh, with the same with heroin. You can you can or morphine. You can use it creatively in small amounts, but most people can get rid of pain by reflexology, by brainwave synchronization, uh, by freeform dancing. There's all kinds of ways for pain relief, and of course, mainstream medicine won't tell you about those because. Uh, it's uh you know it cuts into their business <laughs> yeah i think it was like a month and a half ago i experienced intense back pain like mid back and i was doing e stim patches red light therapy chiropractic massage i did so many things cbd i mean everything nothing got rid of the pain um you know except for like thc <laughs> actually killed it but i endured it for 9 days straight and it seemed like it was more like a spiritual psychological thing because it just, it went away overnight. You know, usually back then it just lasts for a long time. Right? When we have traumas, they definitely happen. Uh, I've seen many people, when you get to who's the matter with me, I, I'll give you a perfect example. Someone came in to see me one time and uh, they could barely walk in the door. Their back was so far out. And so I told them to lie down on the carpet. And I got a hold of their feet for mind hacking. And again, like pulse reading, you have to learn all the different pulses. With, with mind hacking, you just have to know yes or no. So while I turned in her feet, I said, is anyone bugging you? And she said, yes. And her right foot jumped. And she said, my husband. But because she said the husband and was on the right foot, I knew it wasn't the husband. So I asked her an interesting question. I said, is there a woman involved? in this in any way, like your mother-in-law, another woman? Oh yes, two of them. And one of them said, I don't care if he is your husband, I'm going to have him. <laughs> and uh, 
And then I said, do you have any sisters? Because often that comes from a childhood trauma with working for the father's love. And she said, oh, my God, two sisters. And one even has the same name as one of the women. And she stood up and walked out with no back problems, no back problems at all. And she said, I'm going to go give those women a hug, tell them I understood. And then they never bugged their husband again. So that's how dramatic it can be. Uh, very dramatic. Uh, shock can cause uh, problems. I, I was talking to, uh, I'm doing a blog about uh, a cruel pathologist would beat dogs together with a hammer. What they noticed was high blood sugar when they did that. And uh, the high blood sugar, someone saw someone come in that got beaten up severely and they checked the blood sugar. They had diabetes from, the, from being thumped around like that from trauma. And uh, I've told a story a lot of times about this woman that came into the health food store I worked in and said, uh, can you tell me something? I go to the doctor. I get a complete checkout. I'm perfectly healthy. Clean the bill, bill of health. A month later, I break a rib. I go to the doctor and uh, and uh, he says, let's do a test. We did one last month. Well, it's free. Let's just do it again. He says, now I have severe diabetes. How could that be possible to get diabetes in, in one year? And I said, easy. You had to break the left sixth rib on the left side. And she jumped back and said, how did you know that? <laughs> and I said, because that's the vulnerable part for diabetes. I done that rib. And indeed it was. Now, I didn't go into the who's the matter, that kind of trauma with it, because customers come in a health food store, they don't want to be psychoanalyzed, right? They just want something for it. But anyway, she was amazed. She thought I was a psychic. And actually, I just knew the physiology and what parts are most vulnerable to your body. And that rib is what they call a neurolymphatic point, known by the chiropractor, you know, by osteopaths know about those. They're called the Chapman reflexes. And so I studied those. When I studied uh, Touch for Health, I went into deeper and went to the Chapman reflexes, which I found at the local library here at UCSB Library, and studied those. And those reflexes have a lot to do with our health and what diseases that we think are either from the environment or, or, or from something we ate or from some genetic thing, which is mostly false, but uh, actually have from injuries. Yeah, I'd be wondering about, uh, like, I know some people that have experienced, uh, even recently, like TBI, traumatic brain injury. And I know a common recommendation, like even the Bulletproof guy recommended this years ago, taking high dose fish oil, like the whole bottle at once, when mm -hmm. you experience severe brain trauma, um, because it supposedly protects the brain. I guess if you know there's not bleeding, if there is bleeding, then it's super dangerous to do that. <laughs> Good but, I wonder, like you, like you said, with the glucose thing, I wonder if maybe it shifts the glucose utilization in the, in the brain cells, and that's part of the trauma that happens. And if you can get sugar into the cells in sugar the brain. Sugar in the cell can be really beneficial. In fact, any stress, if I'm under stress or even pain, uh, I use sugar for pain. Uh, sometimes I have to go to thieves oil or garlic or aloe, but many times I experimented with it. And if I would get a toothache, I would start taking sugar. And sometimes it took half a teaspoon, and other times it took four tablespoons. But almost invariably, 80 to 90% of the time, the pain would be completely gone with an abscess tooth. So I'm big on sugar. And there's much research to support that that has been hidden lately because they don't want people to know that it's a perfect therapy for bed sores. You give a person sugar and actually rub it on the bed sores and they go away completely and you don't need the drugs or the people dying people die from bed sores sugar is what nurses did routinely and knew about it and now you look at the nursing generals uh magazines uh i used to study some of those and someone said you ever heard about sugar for healing abilities oh that's a method it just helps the medicine go down that's all you use it for must be some kind of a, some kind of a fake news. They, well, they didn't have that word back then, something like that. And I, and I thought the old time nurses knew about this. I've talked to many people who were nurses in the 40s and they knew about it. 
on Facebook. Often some of my friends uh, will say, hey, I'm a nurse. I saw this happen and that happened and this happened. Many cases of it. And I've read about it extensively before. And Ray Pete, of course, uh, talked about it extensively as well. Yeah. And it worked for me. <laughs> it kept me from getting the flu when we had a really bad epidemic uh, about three years ago, by the way. Uh, I took coffee up to uh, up to two quarts of it, and I took a sugar bowl uh, with that or more. And then I thought this is because I had uh, vibrant gout was very sick. She didn't take sugar, and she uh, uh, had a tonic shock. I thought she died in my arms, so I was traumatized. She couldn't walk or anything, and I had to wheel her back and forth. In a fortunately, in the place we were staying, because we were uh, we were. Uh, escaping the, uh, the fires and the floods we going on here. We were at a ranch and I wheeled her in and out on an office chair that they happen to have in the, in the kitchen. And that's the only way I could get her to the bathroom. Well, anyway, uh, uh, I kept taking sugar, but at one point I thought, this is crazy. I mean, this much coffee and this much sugar, I'm just going to kick back. I started to get serious flu season, uh, flu session. We were out in the, on a ranch, nobody around. And I thought, oh, my God, we're both going to die. So then I got depressed. But then I thought, I'm going to go have coffee right away. Symptoms went immediately away. I never got the flu. Vibrant gal recovered. And she's eating a lot more sugar these days. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Are you still doing about five pounds, five pounds a month? Uh, I think I'm about five pounds. We, uh, uh, I think we're at five pounds, yeah. Uh, five to six pounds, depending on how much stress I, I get into. Lately, it's been pretty good, so I'd say five pounds. I buy it in 25-pound bags now. <laughs> That's awesome. I, yeah, I've only found, I think, the five-pound bags, but I have to move up to that. <laughs> yeah, I, I finally found them at, uh, what is the name of the place? I uh, can't even think of one of these discount places, uh, uh, downtown Santa Barbara. I found the 25-pound bag. Ray Pete finds 50 pound bags. I don't know where he finds those. I'm going to have to exercise to pick up a 50 pound bag these days. I haven't been working out for a long time. You do sugar baths with that. Just say, <laughs> you're right. You're right. <laughs> I don't know if they're yeah, really beneficial. Actually, on your skin, it's very beneficial for the skin, too. And of course, they demonize sugar. Uh, you tell people you take white sugar, they go crazy. What? <laughs> Yeah, well, I've been, uh, uh, look at uh, uh, Warren Buffett. He's ninety, and he gets one quarter of his calories from high fructose corn syrup. Can't be too bad. And Charlie Munger eats all that uh, sugary, sweet stuff, uh, peanut brittle and all. He's ninety-six. Now look at him; he's really bloated a lot, but he's alive. He's hanging out. He's making lots of money, enjoying himself. And uh, you see a lot of health food gurus who avoid sugar that are dying or sick. I feel like like the combo might be the winning combo is like limiting PUFA and eating sugar. Because a lot of the people will only do one or the other, right? That's enough to make a a, a big a difference. In fact, one thing I approve of is a guy named Aubrey de Grey, and he has the seven deadly sins of aging, which I'm going to read: mutations in chromosomes, mutations in mitochondria, junk inside cells, lipofuscin. Junk outside cells, lipofuscin. There's two of seven. And then we have uh, too few cells and too many cells. Like cancer is too many cells. And you're just losing muscle mass too few. And the last one's interesting. Advanced glycation end products, browning to death, age cross-linking, and they call it glycation, which is sugar. But sugar is a minor aspect. There is something called methylgloxyl which Aubrey de Grey says is 10,000 times more toxic than sugar. And he said, of course, we wouldn't adjust the sugar in your body because it's essential for life. And yes, too much of it can be a problem, but it's essential for life. You don't want to mess with it. But if you're going to mess with anything genetically or with the drug, go for methyl oxide, uh, methyl glycine. And uh, the, it turns out that the browning is mostly protein, and mostly uh, fats. The fats are less than the protein, but it turns out that the proteins are scraps from the broken mitochondria. 
And I agree with uh, someone I usually don't agree with much, is Brian Peskin. At least he knows that fish oil is bad for you. But he says that the facts are the control me mechanism. And that fits the waste products of the uh, protein. So they tell, and Re Emmanuel Ravisi says the same thing. They tell the proteins what to do. They tell everything in lipoplexin uh, what to do. So indeed, advanced glycation waste product, lipofuscan again. Three out of seven of the aging things boil down to lipofuscan. And if people are going to take like get lipofuscan, they by the time a person is 100, 75% of their cell is lipofuscan. And it's not passive. It's like having it's not like having junk in your room. It's like having rodents in your room that might bite your ankle if you're not wary enough. Yeah, it, it, they used to think it was just passive junk. So, okay, you can still operate with all that junk in your room, but now they know that it's aggressive, and they have a so it's more important than those seven deadly sins of aging that Aubrey de Grey goes in. He's diagnosed the problem really well. He's looking for genetic solutions, unfortunately, in drugs. Uh, but this can be done through foods because where do drugs come from? Food originally, <laughs> and now they just figure out how to make it in a laboratory, but. Originally, they get the information from food, so why not take the food? That's a really good point about lipofusca not being just static. That it's, I mean, it's activated by light, aluminum, estrogen. There's so many things, right? And iron. <laughs> yeah, iron, iron is what it just needs. One percent of iron becomes highly aggressive at that point. Wow. Well, I think there's a pretty good, pretty good run. It's starting to get get dark up here, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um well, yeah, it's been fun. we'll get dark here pretty soon too it's uh winter time after all yeah yeah days are shorter. I, i'm worried now. I'm, yeah Sorry, definitely ahead. shorter <laughs> <laughs> we're in hibernation well, mode this is a good time to get extra rest actually uh this time of year uh and rest you you can sleep consciously uh again my mentor you try to creep up on him when you thought he was sleeping man it scares the pants off you. Uh, I have a friend named Steve Shiver. He went to creep up on him one time, and suddenly a dog was going like this, seemed like he was asleep, and suddenly, yeah, he jumped up and scared the heck out of him. And I've tried to catch him sleeping, and then he'd look at me and wink at me all the time. Yeah, he uh, he was conscious all the time, but he was in Delta. He really did sleep, but he slept while he was awake. And this is possible with training. It's like, uh, you know, it's hard to wire walk, but you can do it. People obviously do it. It's hard to do a single finger stand. Well, people have done it before. And so it just takes training. And uh, and to do some of those feats, it just takes extra work. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I feel like I still have work to do with my sleep, but it could be all my keto days or all the supplement. I mean, I heavily supplemented grams and grams of omega-3s daily. Um, but more sugar, right? It probably speeds up. <laughs> sugar is important. You know, I was lucky with omega threes, but but the supplementation because uh, uh, first of all, in the health food industry, I realized that the Eskimos who are taking it only live to their thirties and forties. They have great teeth and everything, but they don't live very long. And then I discovered in the nineties, Emmanuel Ravisi, and he said that if you take omega threes, a long chain omega acids. For more than six weeks, you initiate an adrenal response that is hard to turn off. So already in the 90s, when I would take some, uh, uh, when I found a good type of uh, cod liver oil, I would take some of it, but never more than three weeks to a month at all. So I would buy the big bottles for economy and take about a, you know an inch deep and throw the rest away because obviously that stuff gets bad very quickly. Well. It's actually bad by the time you get it because they say, well, what if I nitrogen preserve it? Well, do you think they nitrogen preserved it when the ship was coming like to New Zealand? They get their fish oil from fish in Argentina. Well, those ships aren't jet propelled if they go all the way. It is sat with uh, Monsanto's chemical to keep it from blowing up the boat, by the way, to New Zealand before they ever nitrogen pack it. So when they give you that baloney about, oh, this is nitrogen packed. The other, it's only when you leave it hanging around. And of course, in your stomach alone is enough to uh, to uh, 
make the uh, make the fish oil a uh, breakdown, DHA and EPA and even AOA. Those uh, break down very quickly and the byproducts flood your body with well, well, the reaction to it is lipoplastin. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's kind of hard to find. I mean, you can't find a definitive study that say omega threes cause lipoplastin in black and white because you have to know the chemical names and um, all these things. But I think looking at people like Charles Poliquin or Jack Cruz, like Charles Poliquin, he was prescribing high dose fish oil to his athletes that he was training, and I mean, he died at age of fifty seven. So like, I think it's helpful to look at people that are kind of living it and then see how they do instead of trying to like constantly look for a definitive study, which, you know, there's so much money behind the omega three as industry that I don't think we'll ever see a definitive study <laughs> that it says in black and white, no. you know, you have to and know like the breakdown products and lipid peroxidation. It's hard to find it again. You have to put yellow fat disease and many of its names and then go to various animals. The hardest one to find was that bears get yellow fat disease. Indeed, your inland bears have much less life of skin than the ones that eat uh, fish. And bears are, we talked about this in one of your shows, they're really about 97% vegetarian. And they they eat like uh, buzzards. They eat dead, uh, dead animals. When they come out of hibernation, they're lying all over because they didn't survive the winter and they've been frozen. <laughs> So frozen steak, go eat the animals. Then they go down and eat the sedges and the grasses and things like that. So they eat fish when it's necessary. Uh, if you live uh, someplace where there's nothing but fish, of course, American Indians did that. But Apaches, they had plenty of fish, but they knew they were bad for them. And they wouldn't even eat a waterfall. Anything that ate a fish, they wouldn't touch. It was like the devil to them, huh? And uh, the uh, Zunis didn't eat fish uh, either, and neither did the Navajo. So go figure. And they and look, the healthiest people are these desert people, the Bedouins and things like that. Edward Abbey has gone into that in detail. Well, they didn't have DHA. Right here in Santa Barbara, they did a study. They found that the Indian diet was 50% uh, omega-3s and 50% nonsense. The Apaches, how could that be? <laughs> they didn't even... <laughs> They wouldn't eat any, a single fish. Geronimo lived to 80, died of an overdose of alcohol and getting pneumonia from being drunk in the rain. And he never had a fish in his life. He didn't know what one tasted like because it was forbidden by the Apache. Wow. Wow. Yeah, and I mean, I'm sure there was a lot of dates, right? Sure. I mean, in the desert, you have more fruits than... <laughs> Yeah. Well, they also ate the deer and they ate the venison, buffalo, all that kind of thing, uh, but they just wouldn't touch fish. Even they had to be, some of the Indians wouldn't even eat them if they were starving. And others waited till they were close to that. Then they knew you have to survive. Same thing was up in the Arctic. They, they know that to eat too many fish causes, they didn't call it yellow fat disease, but they knew they would die from it. Farley Mowat, who wrote Never Cry Wolf, uh, uh, several books, uh, Whale for the Killing, a lot of books, was an adventurer. He, he tried to convince the Canadian government not to give nets to the Indians to catch fish. They're the people of the caribou. They eat caribou. And they knew that fish were a survival food. But if they ate nothing but fish, they would die quicker than starvation if they lived on nothing but a fish diet. And he, he tried to tell that to people today who were taking fish oil. They're killing themselves, you know. It's as simple as that. They're committing suicide uh, without knowing it, and mm -hmm. and maybe it's only ten years off their life. Like a lot, of, a lot of athletes actually say, "I would rather win a prize and shave ten or twenty years off my life to succeed." And if they want to do that, then okay, fish aren't going to hurt you. But if you really are in the in the longevity game and want to live long, you really can't be eating fish, at least on a regular basis. Maybe right. forbidden food once a year or once a month if you, you really have a taste for it. Uh, but I, I've given it up completely. <laughs> yeah, I still love my fish tacos, but I'll take my vitamin E and make sure I'm eating my carbohydrates. And That, uh, that actually gives you a buffer. Yeah, if you are going to do it, take sweets with it and things that, uh, that buffer. And vitamin E, definitely, because uh, 
vitamin E can prevent yellow fat disease. So it is uh, one thing you can take for it. And uh, if people, if they're in doubt that they're not getting vitamin E, then yeah, take it. Get the uh, Don't get the tocotrienols. That's all false to mislead people to stay away from the toco tocotrienol. Tocotrienols are rare and in, in small amounts, high in rice, I think, and in palm uh, oil. Easy ways to get it. That's why they make it. But really, uh, without tocopherols, life is not possible, I think, uh, pretty much, or most life, 99% of life for sure. It's not possible without, without those four uh, heavy, particularly, I think, on the gamma for you know, life rather than the alpha, which they use to take. But all of those would supply the necessary life ingredients of that for, for tocopherols, not the four tocotrinols. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, uh, awesome. Well, let's see, solartiming.com. I'll put your your link below. And uh, by the time I post this, maybe you'll have, what was it, five or six books, ebooks on sex? <laughs> yeah, let's see. I'm up to, uh, I did November, uh, December, January, February. I started March last night because I just found some information. So I'm just uh, casually. In sex, I have uh, tips on physiology, and I also go for what's really going on in Hollywood. And some of it really is seedy. There really is a lot of uh, bad stuff goes on in Hollywood. But some of it is just plain sex for fun. They're, they're freer uh, than most. But, but there is a lot of hanky-panky goes on there. So I'm kind of giving a, a, a view. I was a cab driver in Hollywood, so I know a certain amount about Hollywood. I, I would take hookers home early in the morning from staying overnight at places, houses and stuff like that. I was in a committed relationship and uh, I was asked to be in a porn movie and stuff. Of course, I declined. And uh, I was with a meditator at the point and we were doing our own thing. <laughs> you didn't want to eat the tuna? <laughs> you know, yeah, back then I was eating tuna though because I, uh, let's see. Actually, I was a vegetarian though for 14 years. That's probably what saved me where I did not eat any fish during that time so uh, but i still ate eggs because i was paranoid about protein and uh i ate uh eat yeah i ate dairy too i ate dairy too most of that time a lot of dairy actually as much as two quarts of milk a day and sometimes two quarts of half and half a day never could gain weight on it the only way i gain weight is in the gym otherwise i can sit and be a couch potato, watch television, don't get any weight. I only gain muscle mass. I guess that's a blessing because I'm really <laughs> lucky. But when I go to the gym, I can uh, gain muscle mass pretty quickly. And I have a muscle memory. Right now, I'm so skinny. If I turn sideways and stick out my tongue, people think I'm a zipper. But, <laughs> but if I go to the gym, it builds up really quickly. We have something called muscle memory. And once you do it once, like I did, the second time, which took uh, a year and a half, took like three months to get to the same place. Now you have to, I, I don't like the concept of age, but there is a certain wear and tear on your body. It would take me a little more, but I could probably get back to the shape I did in a year and a half in like eight or nine months. I'm always thinking about like from a longevity perspective, like I think a lot of men especially want to have just a ton of muscle, but it doesn't seem very efficient, right? Because you need more sugar to run those muscles. That's always in the back of my mind, like, it, wouldn't I need more fuel, which makes it possibly unsustainable at some point? I don't know. It's true. A, a, a gymnast body is the best. We used to be people that can do joints and iron crosses and things like that. That is the type of body that's ideal, uh, uh, like an Olympic gymnast. And you don't see those big muscles aren't going to allow you to do handsprings and uh, cartwheels and all that kind of thing. And fortunately, I like gymnastics a lot. I, at one time, I could do flips over on the lawn over sawhorses and do a, a handstand into a, into a ground kip, into a rolling ground kip, and do a hands on the chest ground kip. I had uh, longer legs, so it used to amaze people. I wasn't on the gymnast team, but a lot of gymnasts couldn't do a handless ground kip or a rolling ground kip into one or a handstand into a ground kip. And at one time, I loved gymnastics. What? My goal was to walk a whole block on uh, my hands. I never got that far. I got about a quarter of a block, though, at beach particularly. 
I couldn't go to the beach without marking on my hands. It was impossible. <laughs> what about breakdancing? Oh, you know, I tried that. I didn't do very well. And I became fascinated in the 80s. I went to New York in 1980 before I came a fan. And some black guy jumps in front of this guy. And I think, oh, he's going to mug him. And he drops to the ground. He does all these moves. And I said, oh, that was the coolest thing I ever saw. And the white guy is like, oh, what just happened? <laughs> and then I started hearing about break dancing. It was in uh, Flash Dance. Or, no, was that? What was the one? It was a break. It was a movie about uh, a type of dancing, and they had a break dancer in it. Then it became a national fad. Everybody was doing it. Uh, I took a couple of lessons, wasn't very good at it, and I admire break dancing. Now. I think it's, it should be an Olympic sport. Some of them are so amazing and have the flexibility that you just can't believe if you look at the uh, look at some of the videos on it. They've progressed. They're even better. Some of the things they do with their bodies are just unbelievable. <laughs> Yeah, even the basic, I think it's called the windmill, blows my mind, where they just kind of twist. I know, I know. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, they're, uh, they're really good. <laughs> There's another kind of dancing called clown dancing, which is more thump, thump, thump. And they've had contests between the both. I still like the old-fashioned break dancing better, the uh, steady rock crew, all those groups that were popular in the 80s. Those guys were really good. Really good. I love to watch breakdancing movies. I've probably seen uh, the California ones. There were two of them, and I think I've watched those about five or six times. And the one that Harry Belafonte d directed about graffiti uh, writers that had a lot of breakdancing in. That probably is my favorite and one of the, the best of all of them. Since then, they're, they've become kind of a formulaic and you know, a little bit boring. I just watch them sometimes for the dance scene. And forget all the drama that goes on. Uh, I like the acting better in the '80s movies. Yeah, there was a documentary I watched called Mountain Talk. Uh, these people in the Appalachian Mountains, I think it was like South Carolina, that did that tapping kind of dance because that's all they oh, yeah, like, all yeah. they, they have, and even that impresses me because they're just moving their feet so fast and clicking them, you know. <laughs> it, it's impressive. I just found out about that about three years ago and started watching all those videos. Really <laughs> interesting. You know, to dance, uh, there was once a story about a guy who finds this monastery up in uh, Asia someplace. And he says, what is, what is your, uh, your theology? We have no theology. We dance. <laughs> and I always remember that. Uh, I, I've always liked freeform dancing. We had a place here in uh, Santa Barbara called Dance Away. And you would go, no alcoholic beverages, you would take off your shoes, and you would move on the floor free form. And I already had discovered Sufi dancing, where a lot of that was uh, in action. So I, I went regularly to dance away and went to other places that had those kind of free form dancing. To just move is fine. I've done Sufi whirling, too. If you whirl at a certain speed and you look at the stars at night, they form a solid ring, a solid ring. And it's very fascinating. And whirling can get you energy if you uh, know how to use it. So I've studied some of those esoteric techniques. I went to a Sufi camp for six weeks at the R.J. Reynolds estate. And Josh Reynolds was a Sufi. <laughs> I knew him. He, he did Sufi exercises right beside me. And he wow. told me that if you get a bee sting, put tobacco on it. But guess what? He died of lung cancer from smoking. <laughs> <laughs> he died at the Sufi, the Sufi property in Torian, New Mexico, by the way. Yeah, he was a great guy, great guy. And the other brothers, uh, the, the Reynolds brothers, thought he was crazy. So they, they took him off of the property in, uh, in, the, uh, in the Smoky Mountains. No, let's see, North Carolina Mountains, where they had their estate for years. And he bought uh, my Sufi teacher an entire big piece of property in Torian, New Mexico, and turned over the deed to him. And uh, Adnan is in his 90s, still doing these impressive Sufi exercises and whirling and exercises with your abs that would make a 20-year-old make a wouldn't be able to keep up with Adnan. I've heard he swam for as much as 24 hours straight. He's done all kinds of things. And he used to start his workshops when I first started coming. Uh, to take his workshops, he'd, he'd run out on the floor and do a full flip, and then we'd start the exercise. And boy, 
I called it Soupy Boot Camp because <laughs> I worked out so much that the following morning, after exercising straight for 14 hours, I was so stiff with lactic acid that I said, surely he's going to be easier on us today because I'm like a cripple. But then I learned an amazing thing about lactic acid. He didn't take it easy on us. And by the end, the lactic acid burn was gone. Now, that's not supposed to be lactic acid. Whoops. Are you still around? I got to hit a button here. Yep, still here. You ran <laughs> off. We're still here. Uh, the, uh, I learned that the lactic acid went away. So they claim now that the ache after is from muscle tears. Well, then how did it go away the second day? So there's something very wrong. I talked to a, uh, a Mr. America one time, Lance something. Don't remember his last name. And he said he found the same thing in his research, that they don't really know that much about lactic acid. And so it's been fascinating to me, and that's why Ray Pete is so much into it, and and reinterpreting Warburg like he really meant. He didn't say sugar was bad. He said lactic acid was bad, and unburned sugar was the problem. Interesting. Yeah, and it it seems like unburned PUFAs are also a problem, right? Because they, they are. And burning, too. Well, actually, <laughs> burning, if you can burn them, then you're okay because uh, they're not there anymore. Uh, and it has a few side effects in the burning. But unfortunately, we store it, and our storage fat is supposed to be mostly oleic acid. Ironically, we're closer to an olive than we are to a, a steer. But so is a cow. Oleic acid is a very important monounsaturated acid. You can get it out of olive oil, or if you ate no fats at all, your body would manufacture it out of sugar. But unfortunately, I don't know anybody who's on a total fatless diet, so they better get some saturated fat in their body to compensate. Yeah, you, you had me more excited about olive oil. I found a, a good company um, that I use, but it's with the carrot salad. And it's, you know, I put my apple cider vinegar and my salt and sometimes beet powder and just make it kind of fun and enjoyable. But now I enjoy my olive oil a little more after hearing you talk about oleic acid in all our episodes. <laughs> yep. You know, on the on the carrots, I would really like to question Ray Pete about that. Because Beaumont was an army surgeon that looked at Alexis Carroll's open belly wound for 12 years. And he examined everything happening in the stomach. And a raw carrot, if chewed properly, like a cooked carrot, you just said at the same speed. Now, that would mean that Pete has to be talking about something that happens downstream of the stomach. Because otherwise, it doesn't work, like they say. He says it doesn't digest, but it clearly digests. But digestion isn't in the stomach. And to be fair, William Beaumont only examined what was going on in the stomach. He he reached in the hole. He put the food in the stomach acid outside of the body, inside of the body, measured the temperature, the humidity in the air, the climate, all of these things. He knew more about the digestion of the stomach than anybody before or since. And uh, uh, But anyway, he didn't know what, much about what happened downstream. And he was a, uh, what do you call it, a person that believed in evidence, <laughs> the real evidence-based medicine. It's a fake now, what they call it that. But he wanted to, he actually tasted the stomach acid to see what it tasted like in, in uh, Alexis de Carroll. And uh, the Army War Museum wanted him to mummify him and take him to America. His relatives, when he went to, back to Canada, hid him out and waited until the body decomposed so the Army couldn't ship his body out of Canada to the United States, to the U.S. War Museum. They're a very fascinating story. Way back, he did this in 1820s and 30s. That's a long time. That's a, 200 years ago. He knew more about the stomach than the people know today. Wow. I always think about those old science videos, from like I think the 80s or the 90s, where uh, like it shows you know what's happening in the stomach and the secretion, and it looks kind of gross, you know, when food's falling down in and uh, the chyme and all that. And, uh, yeah, the human body is incredible, when, especially with digestion, what it can do. <laughs> and they knew more about it before the Second World War. Then they started complicating the textbooks and making them esoteric and putting chemical names in and formulas that nobody could understand. Back in the day, anybody could go back and read a medical book, AMA journal, whatever, back uh, 100 years ago, and it's clear. 
and they had remedies for things that they forgot. Look at the sugar one. They knew sugar was good for you back then. And now, oh, sugar is evil suddenly. Fructose is evil. Fructose is in food, natural food. Got to be bad. It's natural. We got to make synthetic food. All great reset stuff. <laughs> they they want to it... feed us with artificial meat and artificial <laughs> this and uh, GMO that. One of the most common arguments I get against sugar, especially white sugar, is that it's bleached and that's why it's white. But you said like the brown sugar is actually the one that's bleached, right? Or, or that they've well, sprayed. No. Uh, I, I think when you get it, uh, when you get the pure white sugar, I believe the bleach is left out of the formula. There could admittedly be some research in it, but bleach appears in a lot of other places that we don't know about. And the thing is about it, in the brown sugar, you're likely to get glyphosate re uh, residue. But white sugar is nothing but, uh, what is the formula, C22, whatever it is. That's all that's in there. Anything else, they test for trace elements. So ironically, your purest form of sugar is going to be uh, the GMO-free, which I get, C-H, uh, C-N-H, uh, cane sugar is what I use. And uh, that's going to be purer than brown sugar, which is often they either spray caramel on it or they burn it to make it brown because they take the ingredients out. Now, a good sugar is the cane sugar. When you eat the whole cane sugar, as long as it's free of glyphosate, now instead of burning the fields like they did, they burn it chemically with glyphosate. It doesn't have to be... Uh, it doesn't have to be a GMO product. They just burn it and it goes away. And so you get residue on the brown sugar and the whole sugar and the sugar cane. But you get rid of most of the residue with the white sugar. So paradoxically, white sugar is better for you. It's very similar to Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw in Life Extension, their book, that white bread was less toxic than brown bread. And go figure, but it really is true. It's not, it's not really a food. It just gives you calories, but you don't get all the toxins and the growth hormones and everything else that is in wheat because wheat is a food that will grow breasts on farmers if they eat enough of it or anybody who eats it. Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw knew that way back in 1982 when they came out with life extension and it was known before that. And now it's conveniently, conveniently forgotten by mainstream medicine. Would you say like, because I'm Italian and I love pasta, like einkorn or kamut would be better sources instead of just going for the traditional wheat, like pasta? I, I think uh, if you eat a certain amount of, of wheat, I don't think it's bad for you. Uh, the thing is to try not to get the iron and the, uh, and the they put all the additives in it. I finally found a pasta because I just do it for taste. Every once in a while, I have a tomato pepper soup with, uh, with some beans in it. And I like the taste of a little noodle. It reminds me of my childhood, whatever it is. It's kind of a guilty pleasure. It doesn't really do anything pro or con. It's just mostly for uh, uh, aesthetic effect. And so I found this. I was delighted. I hadn't used uh, pasta for years. And then at the health food store, I found this one that uses no additives at all. And I bought a package right away. And I use it seldom, but uh, I still use it every once in a while. I want it. And I don't think there's any real problem. Uh, if you take butter with it or some kind of fat, it protects you against the particles in the, uh, in the pasta, by the way. Mm. So you get a protection from, a, from a, a monosaturated fat or a saturated fat. I eat butter every time I eat pasta, uh, any kind of pasta. Potatoes, always butter. And if I don't have butter, I put olive oil on it. That's great. Yeah, I, um, you reminded me of a funny, a funny thing that happened to me. I bought uh, rice ramen from the health food store, and I was all excited. And I have like a mouse or a rat problem here because somehow they get into my top covers and they actually ate through the package of ramen noodles that I bought. <laughs> and I'll hear them scurrying around in the roof and stuff. I have to let my cat loose up there, I think. <laughs> yeah, we put everything in glass bottles. Oh, and strangely smart. enough, even with the oxygen, in, when we kept our vegetables in plastic, they broke down really quickly. 
now we put them in a glass bottle and they break down they last twice as long in a glass bottle for some reason we even were having trouble with our raw milk it would break down in a few days we simply put it in a glass bottle we just decided to do that about a, a few weeks ago and now the milk is lasting right through to the next week otherwise it doesn't go from saturday to saturday because our shopping day is the market the saturday market is open so we go there and any kind of uh, thing we need that we can't get at the market we go to a place called lazy acres basically a supermarket or maybe there's a sprouts in town what we can't get there we get down to sprouts but well, if 80 you look of our food comes from local farmers at the local farmers market that's awesome if you live closer i would give you guys my goat's milk i have more than <laughs> okay. i could drink. More than I could use. <laughs> you know, we just found the same company that made the, the milk and the cheese we get uh, now is doing a goat milk. So we're going to try that next week and see how that tastes. Uh, I've drank a lot of goat's milk before. And uh, I, I worked for a guy in Redding, California, who had uh, had goats. And so I drank some of the goat milk back then. Good stuff. And good for yeah. Great source of selenium. And I've been making a lot of cheese. Like I'll take a gallon of milk and make, or two gallons and make a huge block of goat cheese. And uh, I'll actually give it to my chickens. So they're eating like royalty. <laughs> Great. That's the kind of food to give chickens. Yeah. Makes them healthy <laughs> instead of giving them uh, omega-3 fatty acids sure. like some of them are eating them now. They've ruined the egg. Egg is still good even if it has omega-3. But if you can get a farmer that doesn't use them, uh, and we ask our farmers about that. We have multiple sources. We have a pretty good source of a lady that uh, it pretty much leaves the fatty acids out of the equation. But That's she awesome. believes they're good for you still. <laughs> but <laughs> fortunately, she uh, leaves her chickens to do more natural eating. You can tell them the yolk, like the, the yolk from my chicken looks so different from store-bought because I'll supplement sometimes with store-bought. And it's night and day. And I don't know if it's just the carotenoids. I feel like there's more than just the carotenoids in there that are. I suspect there's more too. Uh, we had one farmer down there where the egg was so pale and didn't taste very well. So we, we were getting them cheaper and maybe that's the reason. So we switched back to our regular egg lady and we, she has really good eggs. Yeah. yeah we, I have two a night, two a night, you know, uh, what's his name? Uh, I still can't think of the bodybuilder that trained, uh, uh, that trained uh, Vince Gironda. Gironda. He ate, recommended 20 whole eggs a day. And he said that would replace your testosterone. People think wow. he's crazy. I don't know, but he did it regularly. And he had my friend Don eating a whole bunch of, uh, of eggs and drinking milk all the time. Uh, Don would eat oranges, skin and all. He would eat the banana, skin and all. <laughs> he had quite a diet going for him. Well, he lived, uh, I just did the math. He he lived 22 years longer than Charles Poliquin, Vince Granda. So that's, yeah, he, I mean. He, uh, he did pretty well and he was in good shape. And you couldn't do certain uh, certain exercises. He wouldn't allow squats. If you were caught giving a squat, if you wanted your money back, all you had to do is do a squat. He'd go to the cash register, get the money, throw it at you and say, get out of my gym and never come back. <laughs> he was a real fanatic guy. <laughs> Uh, Don, both Don and Arnold Schwarzenegger worked out together with Vince Gironda. But then uh, Arnold went over to the Goals Gym crew who did squats and these other exercises. Don stayed and was trained mostly. He did squats, but uh, not when Vince Gironda was around. But he mostly did other exercises. And he had one of those uh, aesthetic Greek bodies. Yeah, look him up on the internet. He really, really looked good. Really looked good. He was in great shape. And I, I worked at a company with him. We would go through the offices and women would whistle at him. I mean, wolf whistles. He couldn't go anywhere without them whistling at him. Uh, yeah. So I went great. down, I, at that point, I wanted some muscles. I never did really get them like he did. But, uh, but he had, he was built more like a Greek god, not these uh, bulging uh, muscles like, uh, usually when they get muscles like that for uh, for the show, they get off of that stuff and uh, they get healthier. The kind of body that Don had was similar to Frank Zane, who was one of the most interesting bodybuilders, both for understanding of traumas and uh, understanding a lot of uh, spiritual things. I recommend anybody 
listen to one of the uh, YouTube videos of Frank Zane talking about anything. He's a really interesting guy, definitely. And he had uh, really the perfect body. He had uh, he had what bodybuilders should inspire uh, for instead of these, you know, muscle on top of muscle on top of muscle where they can't even move. And they die early with that kind of stuff, uh, usually. Yeah, it seems like, too, if you're stacking muscle on top of, like, scar tissue and fibrosis and lipofuscin, it can make it hard to reverse. Like, it almost seems like you're building on a weak foundation to me, but I don't know. <laughs> it is hard, and those muscles get uh, get locked into uh, place. Like, uh, I, I found out the hard way that when you do, like, a concentration cur curl and you do it without changing the movement slightly, uh, I would do a, pre a triceps press pressed down and my neck went completely stiff i couldn't move it so adon will explain uh torque plus repetition locks your muscle in place don't do that well i stupidly went to the gym and did it again and i had to wait three months till he came back and down and get released after that and you released it then every time i did a triceps push down it would push down one way move my neck forward move the bar slightly away change the position if i was sleepy and i would do a press down i could feel it start with two or three repetitions and then i would make sure everyone was different for some reason i was particularly vulnerable to that and that one happens to be a muscle uh, triceps push down with the triceps were involved with the uh, pancreas interesting enough and you know my father died from diabetes here i am eating all this sugar and so far no problem you want to test if you have sugar diabetes Go pee outside. If the ants come to your urine, uh-oh, you're in trouble. <laughs> they don't come to my urine. <laughs> That's interesting. And and I, I get asked this every day, like, um, Matt, you should distinguish between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. But they're, they can both be helped with sugar, right? Is that correct? Or Both of them, yeah. One, in fact, Ray Pete won't even regard type 2 as diabetes. It's just, frankly, from... Uh, from lipofuscin and uh, nitric oxide and uh, serotonin and things like that. And he says it shouldn't even be called a diabetes. It technically isn't. And they named it that so they could send, sell you drugs for it. <laughs> Basically, the, the entire body, not, the cell isn't working right. The insulin is there. It just doesn't get to the, to the right place. Two very different uh, diseases. So Ray Peter only regards type 1 diabetes as actually diabetes. And when I first found out about William Budd, because a lot of people have gotten over their type 2 diabetes, I wanted to know if it was type 1. And it's clearly type 1 diabetes. Clearly. So anyone who, that, that research is there. The original books are on the internet for those who get to them. Yeah, it's so interesting. I grew up with. I always uh, like to check out and back up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I was just gonna say I grew up with a, a friend that had an older brother that started injecting insulin, um, and it was just it's trippy looking back now with what I know, um, especially the insulin is only like eight percent of the equation, because you have potassium that's stronger than insulin, right? And there's fructose which doesn't even require insulin and there's so many more pieces to the puzzle that a lot of the keto people or carnivore people just focus on like insulin insulin when they you know sugar insulin those two always go together right but not necessarily right there's other other parts to look at definitely and and look ketosis what is a diabetic they're in acetic acetoketosis ketosis a type of ketosis they're very much related and they don't tell people that I really think that the whole ketosis thing is sponsored by the government so they don't have to pay Social Security. Think of all the money they save that way. I really believe that they, they must know this kind of research, uh, except it's not taught in medical school. Most doctors are victims just as much as their patients are. It's their commissars, the people who are above. They know this stuff. They have to know it. Look at... Uh, DuPont knows about yellow fat disease. They they prepare for it. They fight it. But what do they do? They promote omega threes while they have ways of fighting it for both uh, restaurants. Omega threes clog the restaurant machines. 
You can only use a restaurant machine for a week without changing the oil. When they take the omega-3s out, the small amount, by me, leave the omega-6s, they don't clog up for months. And they know this. Uh, Monsanto did, the Vista bean. Theirs didn't go over because they did it for once they tried something non-GMO. Well, that's what they claim. But how do they, how do they put glyphosate in it as well and change it? So I would still call it GMO. Theirs fail. But DuPont's, the Pioneer Seed Company, they're all over the world now. They're taking over the world. And uh, as I mentioned in my last show, about 80 drugs are in the pipeline that contain DHA or EPA. EPA seems to be now, it used to be DHA. Now they're really trying to, to promote EPA for whatever reason. That's interesting. I think EPA is a little cheaper. I used to research that, but... I feel like it's a little less expensive. That's probably the reason you're promoting it. Yeah. <laughs> it costs <laughs> less money. You just gave the answer, probably. That's usually what they do. The cheaper they can do it and shave off the profit at the expense of the consumer, unfortunately, that's the way it operates. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, Adam, this is awesome. And I'm glad that we're on kind of a monthly schedule because I think before these last two episodes, we were I love pretty dramatic. So, um, yeah, um, we'll have to do this again next month. And uh, happy 2021. Hopefully this year is even more interesting than last. <laughs> yep. <laughs> I hope there is a resistance. There is hope. But I tell you, there are a lot of people out there like that. That, that guy's a victim that I ran into today where he runs to the other side of the street because I don't have a mask on. In an area where we used to hike this street uh, for two miles up the road and two miles back, not see a single human being and sometimes not a single car up this abandoned road up here. And uh, so the idea, it's absurd, uh, absurd that this guy would wear a mask. But people are scared. They actually believe all this and they're dying in the hospital. They're dying of the respirators. They're dying of the medicine. If they just leave it alone and do like that guy in Tanzania, where he just put his son on ginger and lemon juice, and that was fine. Yeah, it's the treatment that's killing people. Yeah, I think it was the president of like Venezuela or somewhere in South America said uh, he recommended sauna and vodka or something like that. <laughs> yeah, it probably it works better than what they're giving them. All the drugs, <laughs> even the quinone related drugs, are not good for you. They're malaria drugs, and though there seems to be a kind of a uh, they're supposed to be good for you, but if you really look up, they do have a lot of side effects. And it's totally unnecessary when sugar is much cheaper. But if I go saying sugar is good for COVID on YouTube, oh boy, I'll be in trouble. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> yeah, it was Belarus. Yeah, around Poland and Russia and Ukraine. He said uh, he encourages citizens to drink vodka and visit saunas <laughs> for COVID. <laughs> Probably better. I heard of two bootleggers who were shot up. To, they were full of bullet holes, thought they were going to die. They drank gin. And gin is a medicine sometimes for the kidney. They both survived. Wow. Yeah, they hit their cigarette boat and, uh, and they went someplace to die. One particularly was so shot up, there was no, supposedly no chance of his living. So they said, we want to go out drunk. So they got some of their bootleg gin. It's the purest alcohol you can get, gin, by the way even with a tiny bit of juniper in it. It's really pure alcohol. They drank that and they got well. So every once in a while, I would do gin therapy at one point after I saw that documentary on the History Channel about those bootleggers. So, you know, there's a law. Anything can cause anything and anything can cure anything. So I don't uh, discount that someone can get a disease from something you're not supposed to get it from. But most of us, as a general rule, if you eat poofas, you're in big trouble. If you take iron supplements, you're in big trouble. Right. Vitamin D, ascorbic acid. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, ascorbic acid you can get out of food. And I think there may be a case for a, a, a ascorbic acid, the other type, if you're an oxidant or an antioxidant, if you know what state you're in. But no one is really researching that. And uh, it should be researched, but there's no money in it, so they're not going to research it. Yeah, I know ascorbyl palmitate is the fat soluble form of vitamin C, and I think that has some applications. But 
They, they could have applications. Uh, even uh, Dirk Pearson and Sandy Shaw recommended that particular type back in the day. Now, they were against the dehydroascorbic acid, the one that is naturally in potatoes and other places, because they said it was oxidized. So I believe that. I told people, don't get the dehydroascorbic that, that type uh, at all. And don't get it in liquid because it goes into the form from ascorbic acid. To de, uh, anyway, I had no clue about what was going on. I believed everything as, as viable. The only thing they were against, really vehemently against DHA and EPA. Now, somebody has told me they changed their tune. Like they're recommending it. So I was really surprised because they were totally, any oil was rancid. And omega threes were the worst. Mm -hmm. Anyone can get a hold of a life extension at the library if you're in a state where the library is still open. Not here in California. Uh, if you have a copy of their book, I still have. I'm on my third copy. I think I keep giving it away and then getting it back because it is a very valuable uh, book. The advice isn't all good, but I really like the fact that they're so against fish oil back in the day. Yeah, their points. I I think where they mentioned vitamin E, there's usually lipofuscin. And like, I was really impressed with certain sections, how detailed they get. And yeah, maybe someone offered them an island, you know, big omega said, so I'll buy you an island if you, if you could be. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it. Yeah, they, uh, and they definitely recommended vitamin E as a preservative for that. But they also uh, mentioned the Monsanto product, the ethoxyquin which I forget the brand name of it. It was, they actually have in their book, a Monsanto sign as a, <laughs> in one of the pages of their book for ethoxyquin that it was a miracle of preservation. And that's what they use in fish farms. Vitamin E is too expensive. So they use ethoxyquin because it's more permanent. And of course it has side effects. They recommend BHT and BHA. They have side effects, especially on the kidney, but they use them commonly in fish farms. And they still. know fish farms, if you're a fish farmer and you don't know that omega-3s are bad for your fish, you're going to go broke. It's as simple as that. And you said it, there's the explosive danger, I think, right, too, for the boats. That what? Yeah. There's like a danger of, ex of the stuff exploding on boats. Yeah. Oh, sure. yeah. They, there's a law against it. You can't ship a certain distance uh, with a Coast Guard and a commercial ship. They have to put ethoxyquin or an equivalent chemical, TPHQ, whatever it is, or BHT or BHA. Ethoxyquin is the best selling one to this day, even though the patents are long gone for Monsanto on that one. But they're common. They use it in fish farms. They use it on ships. They use it in fish meal. It's used in fish byproducts. It's commonly used. It's in pet food, too, uh, non-fish pet food. And there's a big controversy. I think they're taking out the pet food. But now that the fish food, uh oh, you protect your pets, but let the humans uh, eat the stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's sad looking at dog and cat food, like especially because I'm a big cat guy. I grew up with two stray cats, and um, even the healthiest brands contain either salmon oil or herring oil or some type of you know omega three oil, and there'll always be vitamin E with it. But it's like vitamin E succinate or like certain forms and. Um, I supplement my cat with extra vitamin E, you know, and I hope that works, but I've tried feeding her healthy stuff or just straight meat and she won't eat it. She only likes processed. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, you know, the E is your best bet because that's what they do now. Now vets know about yellow fat disease, but they don't know where it's coming from. They say it's from tuna. If you give, if you actually give the fish food, cat food is fake. It's not fish food at all. But if you eat a whole food, that, well, people think, well, I'll give them a can of tuna. Then they get addicted to it and they get lumps all over their body and they get yellow fat disease much faster even than human beings. And so vets tell you that. But now they put the DHA back in and the vets haven't got wise to the fact that it's the same thing as giving them a can of tuna. Uh, it's amazing. Have you ever had people you say, uh, uh, eat, uh, don't eat fish oil, uh, then, uh, then you'll say, uh, uh, well, how do I get my DHA then? That is DHA. <laughs> they don't seem to think it's like a, it's like saying, am I going to eat my lid out of a lid mine or am I going to get it by eating uh, old teeth or something? 
I always feel like the vitamin D thing is the easier pill to swallow because people still, they hear my whole spiel on vitamin D and they listen to the podcast I had on it and they say, but where do I get vitamin D? <laughs> you know, it's like, or how do I supplement it? It's like the big question, but. Yeah. Step out the door. <laughs> and, and you can actually get it in the shade because the ultraviolet light is a carrier and it's refractive. It bounces. Red light doesn't. Red light is straight. It's not bouncing anywhere. You can't get red light therapy if you're in the shade. You have to be out in the sun to get that or have your eyes directed at the sun at least. Better to get the actual rays on your light. But ultraviolet bounces. That's why red light will penetrate into the water, but the ultraviolet light shines back in your eyes and it's kind of blinding. The heat goes into the water and the reflection comes into your eye and the UV light uh, is damaging to your eyes, not the red light. So uh, anyway, all you have to do is go outside, get that ultraviolet light in the sunlight or even for vitamin D in the shade, but not behind a glass window. You won't get any, any behind a glass window. No, none at all once you're behind it. That's interesting. Awesome. Well, um, thanks so much for your time, Adam. This was super fun. And um, yeah, so many things for people to think about. And <laughs> uh, Had fun, it. as usual. Lots of fun. So count me yeah. in next, next month. Yeah, let's do it. And um, yeah, stick around as I close out the show. Thanks so much. <laughs> Will do. is a wrap for today's show hope you enjoyed that it was kind of all over the place but he mounted his horse and rode off in all directions right as adam says always really fun i uh love his stories <laughs> um fascinating about the apache geronimo right that never had a fish in his life wow so a lot of people assume that fish are just a natural part of the diet, especially if they're available, right? It's an indigenous ancestral food, seafood, fish. But what if it was a last resort? What if people knew that red meat, saturated fat, was a healthier, more life-sustaining source of nutrition than like a pescatarian seafood diet. Really interesting how we tend to make assumptions about how humans used to live and then base our lifestyle around that. And a lot of it's just going off of research or articles from major universities. And we just don't question. I know that I didn't. I fell for a lot of the fads and trends and paleo and keto and intermittent fasting is natural feast and famine is natural was it i'd really question that assumption because it is absolutely an assumption to just assume that there was feast and famine you weren't there i wasn't there so we're just going on hearsay and the question i have is are carbohydrate sources preserved in the fossil record? Would you find that in the earth? Would you find residues of berries? No, you wouldn't. <laughs> you would just find bones from meat. And it's really interesting that people never consider that. Or they never consider that the earth potentially was warmer and that carbohydrates were more in abundance back then. I thought that Adam's thoughts on the terrain theory and Pasteur and Bouchard was, or Bouchard was really interesting that Adam takes the middle stance. I think that's pretty smart because I see a lot of people going to the extreme saying that viruses don't exist at all. And I think there's somewhere in the middle. So now Adam has me wanting to look into this Bouchard character where he said that if the colon isn't moving and the transit time isn't fast enough, then bacteria will accumulate 
and can cause issues. And I wonder if that's related to endotoxemia and endotoxin. That would be really interesting. And I also thought it was interesting what he said about hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, I've been delving into that because I recently purchased my own soft shell chamber because I'm really focused on anti-aging and living a long time with the knowledge that I have, especially now about lipofuscin, you know, being four of seven of the deadly sins of aging, Aubrey de Grey's, as Adam talks about. So having the lipofuscin piece and knowing that that is what ages us the most, that is the marker for aging, iron and omega-3 DHA, from that, then I can kind of stack different things onto it. And hyperbaric oxygen therapy is one of those things for me. The angiogenesis part, the creation of new blood vessels, was really the selling point for me because if you can bring more oxygen throughout the body, the various tissues that didn't have it before, and bring them back to life without damaging the tissue, which is exactly what HBOT does, then there's a tremendous benefit uh, systemically in the body. And that's if you can utilize oxygen, right? Like Morley talks about oxygen is a poison. And if we have copper, we can utilize it. But if we have iron overload, then we just rust and it causes oxidative stress. So since talking to Adam, I had actually uh, approached a doctor to talk about it. And the one I purchased comes with a face mask, which I guess I'm going to start wearing when I'm in there, which is usually it's just 100% oxygen. But with the face mask, you actually exhale CO2 and about 5% of that you rebreathe if you have the mask on. So constantly learning, but I found the carbogen Thing really interesting there was a cool etna article about that that five and seven percent carbon dioxide uh, concentration mixed with the oxygen so fun experimenting uh, i think as long as people have bioavailable copper coming in beef liver oysters whole food vitamin c then hyperbaric oxygen therapy can be a huge benefit a lot of studies on it for uh, diabetic ulcers, wound healing in general, anti-aging, uh, muscle recovery, uh, and especially brain recovery. Like I know people with traumatic brain injury, TBI, and that seems like a really long healing journey. But I think if certain things are in place, then that can be rapidly accelerated. And I believe that HBOT has a place with any kind of brain injury. I also thought it was fascinating when Adam talked about freeform dancing being a really good therapy. Uh, you guys couldn't see him, but in the video, it doesn't record. He was moving around and doing his uh, arm motions there. <laughs> and it makes me feel better about my uh, music festival days because I thought I was just wasting my time looking back, but there is something obviously to dancing and according to Adam free flow dancing that is very therapeutic. And that's really what I focused on uh, when I attended those things. It wasn't uh, sex, drugs and techno music. It was dancing for me <laughs> and uh, all night. And I think uh, that can be a huge benefit for a lot of people, especially if they have a lot of the things in place. They're drinking real water, they're bathing in filtered water, they're taking the right supplements, they're not taking the wrong supplements, then I think it's a great tool. And for a lot of people, a fun tool to use in their healing journey. So I'm going to continue to have Adam on the show. And in future episodes, we're going to structure it a little more. It's fun to flow with it, but I would like to have episodes focused on sleep, and then an episode on paranormal activity and extraterrestrials, and then an episode on sex, and kind of have subjects that we can go from. And there were actually quite a few Q&A questions that we didn't get to, and so I'll do my best to ask those in a future episode with him. Check out his website. It's solartiming.com 
Com. I'm going to put the link below. He has, if you click on store, he has many ebooks and he's been pumping out ones, uh, pun intended, on sex <laughs> that are really interesting, uh, that go against a lot of what is shared, especially in the uh, Taoist, you know, Montauk Chia camp. I love that Adam's a contrarian, but he has the research to back it up. And it's really good stuff. So he has a book on carbon dioxide and nose breathing. Uh, he has a whole ebook on vitamin D, the benefits of white potatoes, red light, uh, too much iodine. A lot of people are mega dosing iodine supplements. And his yellow fat disease books are incredible and if you click on adam's ebooks and scroll down you could actually purchase yellow fat disease compendium which is 275 plus pages for 100 bucks and that's great if you're really skeptical about quote efas or essential fatty acids being non-essential then this is a really good primer that you can check out a lot of evidence in there a lot of quotes straight from the horse's mouth, the companies that are selling biotech, algae oil, DHA. If you like Adam's work, definitely support him by purchasing his ebooks. That's how he makes his living. And I think that the information in them is super valuable and unique. You're not going to get that information anywhere else. And also, if you want us to talk about a subject, uh, let me or Adam know, and we'll uh, talk about it. And if you want to support Mito Life Radio and my work, you can go to matt-blackburn.com. I have my recommended products. Most of them have discount codes, and I'm constantly adding products onto there. I actually just put on uh, BioCean Marine Plasma. This is actually... Uh, trace minerals from the ocean. And I've been on this stuff off and on for years. Uh, there's another company that's pretty much the same thing called Kintone. A lot of people probably know about. It's a fun way to get chloride in, but also get in magnesium and potassium, which are drained under stress. Magnesium and potassium are the two minerals to go under stress. And then chloride as well goes in a hypo thyroid state a lot of people are depleted of not only magnesium but potassium and chloride and so this is a way to get all three of them and i average about two to three shots a day and sometimes i'll take more but i definitely feel a difference in my nervous system when i take them regularly and a difference in my brain function you could probably do the same thing with just a pinch of salt throughout the day or put a pinch of salt in your orange juice and get a similar effect. But I would imagine with this, you're getting a lot more trace minerals. I also put up two new products from Get Chroma. One of them is a near infrared flashlight. I think at a really affordable price, way better than anything you'll find on Amazon or a little cheapo light that people are trying to save money with the quality of the leds and the intensity definitely matters and this is one that i really feel i actually use this directly in my eyes because according to a dna test age-related macular degeneration runs in my genes so i just take extra care of my eyes just in case vitamin e niacinamide this near-infrared flashlight, and of course, mitigating artificial light at night. I switch out all my bulbs in my house for red and orange bulbs. I'm actually still waiting for my LED bulbs because I'm using incandescent. And my friend Andrew Latour over at Gemba Red had a great blog post breaking down the flicker, which there's a lot of problems with artificial lights, one of which is the flicker rate which you have to use slow motion on your phone to see. And the flicker is so fast that our conscious mind can't 
notice it, but our nervous system does and our brain does, and it tires the nervous system and the brain. It's a stress, that high intensity flicker rate. And what he showed in the blog post, he measured it, that certain brands, which is the key phrase, not all LEDs, certain brands have a flicker rate that's actually less, like less than 1% of incandescence. A lot of incandescence will be 7 8% flicker rate, which is significant. That definitely does affect the body. So once I get those, I'll be speaking about that. The brand I ordered is Sunlight, S-U-N-L-I-T-E. And there's another brand that he mentioned in the blog post. I can't remember. But light's important. It's really overlooked. And whenever I go to someone's house and there's really bright, full-spectrum white light at 8, 9, 10 p.m., it's really harsh. And, you know, I'm there at a party once or twice a year. <laughs> no one's wearing blue blockers. It, it just blows my mind because it really does affect cognition, overall brain function. So the other product I threw up there is the Sky Portal from Get Chroma. And that one is my favorite product by far from this company. It's basically a huge circle that you can prop up behind your computer monitor. And if you work at an office, especially in a northern latitude like myself, northern Idaho, it is a absolute game changer because it's actually long wavelength blue light, 480 nanometers with 810 nanometer near infrared, both LEDs. But you can actually alter the ratio and the intensity of it. And it basically is bringing blue sky into your office space. And I've messed around. I actually got this little sad light. There's tons of brands where you can use full spectrum light at your desk. And I felt like it was actually stressing me out. Whereas this sky portal feels like it's decreasing my stress with having the proper wavelength and especially combination with near infrared hitting me while I'm doing office work, you know, 11 a.m., noon, 1 p.m., middle of the day. Uh, I definitely feel the difference. So I've been having a lot of fun nerding out here in my office because I spend a lot of time recording for this podcast, doing office work, emails, phone calls, all that stuff. So I've been working on biohacking it and making the ultimate workstation I'll probably be writing about at some point, but I stack a lot of things together, breathe molecular hydrogen. I have the lights messing around with a little Rife machine now and have to multitask because why just sit at your desk and have nothing working on you? I also threw up pearl powder from my friends at Crucial 4. And that is actually a great calcium source. I know a lot of people have issues with dairy. And first thing I would say is don't give up on dairy. Try raw, try goat, try sheep, camel, whatever. Try different sources of milk. Drive to the farm yourself. Don't just give up on dairy because there's a lot of retinol in there, bioavailable copper, easily absorbed amino acids. It's a great sugar source. And it's worth it to try to make it work. And it might just be that you need to have small amounts, or it might be that you need to heal your metabolism and read Kate Deering's book called How to Heal Your Metabolism and work on that for six months or so, then try adding dairy in. But just don't write it off that you'll never have dairy for the rest of your life. That said, calcium is a very important mineral. And the ratio, the balance of calcium to magnesium we've definitely been sold a lie about i believe we've been taught calcium should be two to one two parts calcium one part magnesium that should actually be flipped a lot of people say just one to one but from what i've seen it should be two or even three parts magnesium to one part calcium because magnesium regulates calcium and there's great youtube videos from morley robbins uh, he has some lectures 
just on magnesium, some great interviews just on magnesium if you want to check that out. But this pearl powder from Crucial 4, I take a couple scoops a day as a dental protocol because the forms of calcium in here are really cool. Uh, calcium carbonate and calcium phosphate with these things called signal proteins, which are unique to pearl. And then I swallow it. So it makes my teeth nice and white, feels really good on my teeth, especially if you drink you know, red wine or orange juice or coffee or all of these things that can wear on the enamel. You want to balance that out. I love the oregano mouthwash from North American Urban Spice. I believe it's called Orega Wash. I use that a few times a day and the pearl powder a few times a day. And just pay attention to your teeth. Also, Purely K, my MitoLife product, People overlook the importance of vitamin K2, especially vitamin K2-7, which is called menaquinone 7, for calcium regulation because magnesium regulates calcium, but also K2 regulates calcium. So it's really about getting both of them in the equation to have ideal calcium balance. And... You remember the bones and the teeth are not just calcium, but it is a component. And so I've heard of people reversing cavities with high dose K2, you know, not just taking one or two capsules a day, but taking a lot. And I've had personal experience with cavities disappearing, eating animal foods and supplementing vitamin K2. I think it's a really important piece for not only uh, dental treatment uh, as an adjunct with other things, but as a preventative. I think preventing is always best, especially when it comes to the teeth, because you don't want to have issues with that. It often hurts, and <laughs> the procedures are not fun or beneficial for the body as a whole. So my website is mitolife.co if you want to check out that vitamin K2. That just became back in stock as well as Dissolve It All, which people have been waiting for. And that's systemic enzyme therapy. I talk about that quite a bit on Instagram. And it's really beneficial for any kind of itis or osis. I would use uh, systemic enzyme therapy for that because those tend to be fibrosis conditions, scar tissue conditions. And in combination with animal-based nutrition, a metabolic supporting lifestyle, not restricting carbohydrates, eating animal protein, when you add in systemic enzyme therapy with that, or just integrate as much as you can from the CLF protocol on my Matt Blackburn website, then you could see massive results. I'm mainly using dissolve it all for anti-aging myself. So thank you guys for all of your support, supporting the show, supporting the podcast, supporting my work. It really means a lot. And I'm happy that we kicked off 2021 with Adam Bergstrom. I don't think there was anyone better that could have been the first episode. And I have a lot of exciting guests lined up for this month. I have one on hyperbaric oxygen therapy, I have one about skin care and one on thyroid health. So stay tuned. There's a new episode released every Friday. Please share this with your friends and God bless. Today's quote is from the journal Cell Metabolism, Volume 18, Issue 2, August 2013. Limiting supplies of fatty acids to limit cancer cell proliferation. Since fatty acids are essential for cancer cell proliferation, limiting their availability could provide a therapeutic strategy. From the perspective of lipid metabolism, limiting fatty acid availability could be achieved in several ways. One, blocking fatty acid synthesis. Two, increasing fatty acid degradation via oxidation, three, diverting fatty acids to storage, or four, decreasing 
fatty acid released from storage. 